Bear in the big blue bear. Well, to start with, I can make Bear sound really angry by pressing the repeat button over and over again on his introduction. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And this game story in the adventure mode is that it's Ojo's birthday, another character in the show that is also titled Bear in the Big Blue Bee. And we need to guide her around the house and complete many easy mini games in order to reward Ojo with her presence. And I've got to be honest, this is not actually too bad considering it is a game for babies. It's definitely the best game so far anyway. The production value is nice, it's not insulting or patronising, it controls well when it needs to, all the mini games feel totally different, and this one actually required me to think. It has decent music, a calm and welcoming atmosphere. In fact, the worst aspect of the game to me is the way Bear looks himself. After we explore the entire house and beat every mini game available, we even get a final jigsaw puzzle mini game before the birthday celebration ending screen. And sure, the whole thing took me only 25 minutes to complete, but who cares? This was kind of cute. And I can appreciate what it set out to do because it did it really well. And now I'm going to be very immature. You've won a cum- Yeah, I did. Lilo and running cramp. Okay, fine. Yes, I already did a video on this game too, but Christ alive, that was nearly 10 years ago. I was 17. Don't watch that. No, I'm picking flowers, ain't that cute? <laughs> it's disgusting. I'm disgusting. And if you like it, you're a predator. If you're British, enjoy this weather. Anyway, I'm done waiting. I'm not a bus passenger. So let's take a quick revisit to Lilo and Stitch Trouble in Paradise. What am I going to expect here then? Um... Uh... A whole lot of hula hula. Well, you should have said earlier. Oh, my favourite. Disney interspecies relationships. Well, so far I'm pretty confused. Where's the trouble here? Leela looks pretty happy and Stitch is sitting around waiting to be serviced. Oh, all right, there's the trouble. It's on the disc. Lilo's gonna drown. Well, hey, check this out. I found a gallery in the main menu. And that's my favourite place because it lets us watch a scene where Princess Jasmine seriously considers sleeping with a dog. And then thinks about sleeping with Stitch instead. Hello. My name is Reg Cheesy, and welcome to your paradise getaway for the week, Hawaii. World famous for its beautiful volcanoes, luscious greenery, towering ocean waves, and f human fish. What the hell did they do to Nani here? She looks like a stick of celery. Yeah, I walked forward! Ah, okay, I'm starting to remember this now. This is a Crash Bandicoot clone. And back then on my first video, I must have had a bad case of AVGN-itis just looking for things to complain about, because to be honest, I think this is a good entry-level Crash game. It controls really well, the music is really catchy and relaxing, Lilo can handle volatile explosives. It's great for kids. She can also do a move called a bum bash, which is simply unacceptable. What did homeless people ever do to her? So let's rename it to something totally innocent that I think everyone can get behind. The Clunge Drop. And you may think that sounds a bit disgusting, but hey, I'm not the one that programmed a wispy fart cloud to come out every time you use it. The levels here aren't too badly made, especially for a kid's game. There's plenty of enemies and obstacles, tight life or death platforming. But how does one protect themselves in this beautiful forest full of man-eating plants and... pigs? Why? By using... Voodoo, of course. The weapon of choice for a little Hawaiian girl. Black magic. And it must be pretty powerful stuff since it gives Lilo the greatest special attack of all time. <laughs> Summoning a giant pink man to sit on you. And if you think that's bad, you also get to control Stitch in this game and he has his own unique levels where he comes across the worst obstacles imaginable. Giant stone blocks of himself. Stitch can do everything Lilo does, but also a gross spit attack that looks as wet as I feel, and a spin attack just like Rayman. He can't attack women though. Stitch is woke. You can't forget to mention the biggest difference between him and Lilo though, his coffee meter, or as my 17 year old self called it. Stitch also has an ape shitter meter. Yeah, that's what the manual says. Yeah, that's what the manual says. When he collects enough coffee, Stitch gets up on his hind legs and comes for you. Because once you do that, you can roll into a ball and become totally invincible for a few seconds. The game even teaches you how to cope with real life problems, such as how to deal with bullies by challenging them to a race and forcing them to drive into TNT. But yeah, I haven't got much to complain about here, aside from the bosses, if you can even call them that. So well done, Lilo and Stitch, trouble in Phil Collins. You're a new, underrated PS1 kids game classic. Okay, I'm gonna stop teasing you. Here we go. This was the game I was talking about, the PS1 heavyweight that actually started a million new skating game trends and spawned a thousand poor man imitators. Tony Hawk's skateboarding. 
Okay, is not as catchy as Pro Skater, but did you know that Proskater is a curse word in the UK? Yeah, it's true. It's very bad to say. So when this game came out in the UK, they changed the name of it. And if you don't like that, then you can suck my Proskater. Now this was the one you were waiting for me to talk about, wasn't it? The good stuff, the original, the classic, the start of extreme sports games being so good that everybody would try copying it for years to come. The slow, the clunky, the lumpy, the not quite as good as your nostalgia would have you think- Yeah, I'm sorry guys, there is absolutely no point going back to Pro Skater 1 in my opinion, unless you survive off of disappointment. Don't get me wrong, this game is a classic, make no mistake, it planted every seed it needed to with the creative level design that took everyday locations and turned them into skateboard theme parks, and popularised the addictive gameplay loop of performing tricks while exploring to earn VHS tapes and unlock more levels, but there's so much not here here, especially if you like the later Tony Hawk games. You can't manual to link tricks together on flat surfaces, you can't revert after landing from ramps, the level selection is pretty small, as are the levels themselves, and take around three attempts at maximum to finish. The controls feel a little on the heavy side, especially with getting air off of ramps, you can't wall ride or wall plant for more combo and level design potential, and it doesn't matter how hard you try or how good you smell, it's so easy to not land properly or outright clip through the obstacles. Tony Hawk Pro Skate is Crash Bandicoot 1. It's fine for what it is and amazing at the time compared to the competition, but nah, nowadays it feels like a bathroom trip after Mexican night. A few of these PS1 Disney games have surprised me, such as Donald Duck's Quack Attack. It's a fun enough platforming game where you control Ronald Ruckus as you run and jump through tricky levels, collect milkshakes to make Donald piss himself, and who can forget the Jungle Book Groove Party? I did. It's Dance Dance Revolution, but you get to play as Baloo the Bear. And Lou Bega is in it, looking like he wants to traffic me. Hi, I'm Chris Sorrell. Let me take you through the world of medieval. Sure, CDs were on PC games, but I'm talking about when CD technology hit the video game mainstream, specifically with the PlayStation, which dominated the CD console market in the 90s. <laughs> CDs were like babies covered in soup. They had a lot of stuff on them, they were really thin, and they wouldn't like it if you scratched them. More importantly though, they were just the right shape and size to fit inside your trouser legs. Not the babies, the discs. Games were getting more technical, they were getting bigger, they were getting much harder to explain and show off, and they were getting expensive. So playable demos of games during this era were probably the most important to get right. They couldn't get away with the shareware business model. You can't just learn how to become a communist. But with the good mostly came the bad, leading to forgotten messes such as Tarzan, a platformer where you play as a noseless butternut squash having a dance with a killer leopard, and every jump and attack is delayed, you have a knife that is absolutely useless against anything except for other humans, because this game is rated for 3 to 10 fatal stabbings. And whenever you press circle, Tarzan has post-traumatic flashbacks to his days in the Korean War. How about Toy Story Racer? Another great PS1 game and one of the most underrated kart racers of all time, if you ask me. With some of the smartest and most unique track designs ever, mixing with bouncy controls that feel exactly like you're messing around with an RC car. In fact, back in the ancient history of my channel, the sixth game review I ever did was actually of LEGO Racers. But like every other old video of mine, it's time to get real behind the wheel. Oh, this opening, it still gives me nostalgic chills. If you want me to feel like a kid again, you show me this intro. I don't know why you'd want me to feel like a kid again. <laughs> we then get shown a high octane cutscene that, again, takes me right back to my childhood when I first laid eyes on this game and thought it looked like the coolest and most exciting thing ever. Especially when the PS1 graphics and FMV worked really well with LEGO, since most of the PS1's attempts of making real life people ended up looking like LEGO anyway. And let's be real, the game itself kicks you hard everywhere else with the amount of stuff you get to play with with right off the bat. For a game about Lego pieces going to the races, this is one of the most comprehensive toy boxes for creating your own cars and characters to play with of all time. And this is a PS1 game from 1999. Now, since I have no imagination, I decided to make a character comprised of the ugliest choices in each section of the body. Perfect. I'll name him... Uncle Dip. And let me just say, this uncle is ready for a dip. But what kind of car does he drive? Well, that's easy. Welcome to the Dipmobile. Yes, amazingly, when it comes to creating all of your cars, if you have enough space on the body that you chose and the bricks fit, you can drive it. Which is not only impressive, but also means this is the only kid's kart racer that allows you to drive in a medieval coffin with a spoiler. I mean, sure, you can't see Uncle Dip inside of his own car, but by doing that, I think I've done the world a favour. So as you can see, this is a pretty standard kart racing game. You've got multiple races against you, tons of tracks based off of themes 
themed Lego sets of the time, power-ups to pick up and use, shortcuts to discover by solving puzzles on the track or blowing them up with rockets, and you have to try your hardest to get to first place in each Grand Prix so that you can gloat. The major problem I have with Lego races though is how it controls. I've got to be honest, it doesn't feel that great to play nowadays. The speed is fine, but the turning is some of the heaviest and most awkward I've ever touched. And trust me, I know what you're about to say, it looks obvious why my turning is heavy, doesn't it? But even though the customization aspect may be one of the best bits of the game, from my experimentation, it doesn't make a single difference to the handling of your cars. Nope, not even with the special car bricks you can unlock by coming first in the boss race Grand Prix against classic Lego characters like Captain Redbeard, Johnny Thunder, Basil the Batlord, and Mr. Race Complication. I even made a special car that was completely naked because that's what Uncle Dip likes, and it was just as heavy, but nowhere near as funny as a giant yellow cube. The thing is though, everything else around these floors are so charming and uplifting, I can't be angry with Lego racers. Even the music is completely insane. I also really love the power-up system in this game. You see, you don't just pick a power-up and use it. I mean, you can do that, but here's what you should really be doing. Firstly, you have to grab a different coloured brick to get a different type of power-up. A drop item, shield item, offensive item, and boost item, respectively. And then you can choose to either use it immediately, or save it while collecting special white bricks on top of the current power-up brick that you have to make it more powerful, with three white bricks making it max power. You can destroy everybody in front of you, or open a literal dimensional rift to teleport ahead of the track. It's really cool stuff, and with all the other races stealing the best power bricks that you need, it's not that easy to spam overpowered abilities. Adding a nice bit of thought behind you using the low-powered attacks more frequently to get ahead, or just hoping that you get lucky and saving the more powerful ones for later. And then you remember that there's no four-player mode. In late 1999, with Crash Team Racing already existing on the same system, you can't run anyone over with legs! But you can do that in Carmageddon, our first banned retro game from 1997. At least it was banned in a lot of countries when it first came out on the PC, including the UK to begin with. Because the fact that you got points for deliberately ploughing down pedestrians and collecting their wheat didn't go down too well for our cute little government. And the UK refused to even certify an age rating to the original game for 10 months unless all blood and gore was removed. Because of this, most of the legal UK PC copies you can get of Carmageddon are censored with zombies and green blood, including the opening cutscene. What I'm playing though is the 1999 PS1 re-release exclusive to Europe, which was the same thing as the original game that was first banned, but with added new tracks and cars, and reinstated with a higher age rating for UK audiences. You know what's really bizarre though? The PS1 version I'm playing for this video is more or less the same kind of thing as the original PC release, but only slightly different in the weirdest, tiniest possible ways that still keeps all the violence perfectly intact. So, why did they bother changing anything? So right, we originally banned this game because it was glorifying roadkill but with people instead of badgers, and that's cool, whatever. So this PS1 re-release has zombies walking around instead of people, sure, yeah. I'm with you so far. But despite that, we don't have the green zombie blood in this version, we have red people blood, which was one of the original issues that the UK forced the developers to change for the PC version in the first place. Huh. So in essence, this means the PS1 version is just as violent as the original, but the pedestrian models are just coloured a bit different. Which is even funnier considering that the graphics are so awful you can't even tell what these things are to begin with. Is it a zombie? A person? A dog standing up? A collection of assorted baguettes? With the constant gushing torrents of red blood, I honestly had no idea these were supposed to be zombies until I watched this footage back and checked it again. So this change is absolutely redundant as far as I'm concerned, and that means that this version of the game is practically identical to the very game they wanted banned in the first place. But then, what else do you expect from an initially banned version of a game that has 18 plus plastered all over it, but is also suitable for 15 year olds? Even the intro cutscene is totally different, which is even more confusing because the original uncensored opening didn't even have any blood in it. What is this cutscene supposed to be anyway? This isn't violent mayhem and destruction as much as it is a game of bumper cars. Then your man makes this grin like he's eating his own face, and then this Texan appears and makes this face which should have been enough of a reason to keep the game banned forever, and even after all of that, they don't even hit the sheep. Can't run over people, can't run over sheep, whatever next. Soon we won't be allowed to run over anybody. Not to mention, check out Die Hard Trilogy that came out the previous year. This wasn't banned, this wasn't banned, and this specific moment of running over an innocent bystander with blood all over the windshield was not banned. But this? Oh, no, 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 this is too much. At the end of the day, though, is the PS1 version of this game worth going out of your way to get a copy of? 
No. I don't remember the last time I drove a car in a game that was this stiff. It barely feels like the wheels even turn. You're supposed to be racing in all of these different tracks, but if the one thing that you need to be able to race, that is being able to drive the car, doesn't work that good, then you haven't got much of a racing game, have you? The handbrake is terrible, the brakes in general are terrible, you've got no other choice of car at the start of the game with better steering. Oh, actually, scratch that. This isn't steering, it's a frontal lobotomy. A crash course in survival, eh? <laughs> More like a crash course in how to make a bad game. Yeah! Then there's Aladdin in Nazira's Revenge. Who's Nazira? A woman. And this game sucks too, with a horrid camera, stiff controls, combat that's slower than extracting oil, carpet riding that has checkpoints that spawn you directly into pillars, Checkpoint. Ah! Aladdin running around with cleavage on his back, and Princess Jasmine on a skateboard. And this save screen makes me feel like I've been touched in my bad place. I also need to get a working copy of Bob the Builder, because this one I have is wrecked and refused to work. Bob the no. Part 3. Magazines are good for your peenies. So what better way to get people interested in buying these PS1 games than buy, instead of offering tiny individual demos, bundle small portions of multiple games on a single disc, including video trailers for games not ready to be played yet, and then hiding it inside a thing you have to pay for... A BOOK! The gamer's favourite thing. Yes, in the UK at least, most if not all PS1 demos came as gifts alongside the official UK PlayStation magazine. And that's not including all the demos that came with kids meals at restaurants and stuff like that. This meant that PS1 game demos could appear anywhere. Game stores, video rental shops, Pizza Hut, the dentists, in between my fingers, in space, the morgue. Putting these demos in magazines meant the advertising was more widespread than ever. Just go to the supermarket, buy your dead granny some flowers for her funeral, and while you're at it, pick up a demo of Smash Court Tennis. And up until a certain point, anybody could buy these things. You see here where the magazine is talking about how the newspapers hated GTA for how violent it was? Well, as long as you were three years old or over, you could buy a demo of it. <laughs> this is terrible. As far as I'm aware as well, there was a US equivalent to this called PlayStation Underground, but that never happened in my country, so choke on talcum powder and die. This also provided a service to three types of person at once. The people looking for multiple demos of upcoming PS1 games, the people looking to read up reviews of games that just came out, and the greedy pigs that wanted both. And who can forget Simba's Mighty Adventure, based off of The Loin King, where you play through a load of beige scenes from the movie while Timon leaves his browser history history open. Bumper, try to sit on me. And Mufasa still talks to you even after being killed in a stampede. You must learn the delicate balance of the circle of life. Terrible controls that feel like you're driving Simba instead of moving him. A raw attack that simply doesn't work. Sometimes you can pull yourself up ledges and sometimes you can't. And help me, Uncle Scar! I got stuck in the wall! Why don't I check out Molten Menace by Fisher Price? <laughs> oh yes, in the 90s and early 2000s, a video game didn't even need to be about a movie or a TV show to sell out to the kids. Sometimes you could even base them on baby toys and get away with it. Alrighty then, so what's going on here then? Let's go! Yeah, come on! Team, let's go! <laughs> What is this? Why is everyone running like an inflated uh, chimp? Is this how I'm supposed to run? Have I been doing it wrong? Why does this man look like he wants to kiss me? Why is this man eating his own face? Oh god, another name entry screen? Fine. Rumpy Pumpy. You know, for a video game with a story for children about an erupting volcano murdering everyone in a city, I'm pretty confused by the noises they went with for planes crashing into buildings. How did they even make that sound effect? And who decided that was where it would fit best? So all you do in this game is move around a city to rescue people and animals. You do this by grabbing them with a claw machine or by just being near them. That's it, that's the whole game. What, you were expecting more? Power-ups? Enemies? Jumping? No! It doesn't matter if you're in the air or on the ground, you are doing the same thing with more or less the same controls, and there's nothing else you can say about it. It's bland, it's repetitive, the back of the box states that it builds problem solving and thinking skills, but I've got to vehemently disagree with that. Oh, that's a nice word. There's no problem solving going on here, you just move and collect stuff, nothing more. I suppose the game is kind of educational though, I mean, I now know that paragliders can suspend you in the exact same place in mid-air forever, I now know that volcanic rocks erupting into my face will make me dizzy, and I now know that giraffes can climb on rooftops. And who can forget the worst name for a game of all time, Disney's action game featuring Hercules. One of the prettiest PS1 games you could get at the time, but also one of the hardest to control and even see what you're doing. What can you stand on? Who can hurt you? Who's 
just in the background. Where did that come from? Are you an enemy or a friend? How did they get the real life Danny DeVito into a character model? There was Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. This is where, in my opinion, the legend was truly born. Pro Skater 2 put the dev team Neversoft on the map because at this point, they gave up on realism and stopped making you feel like you were skateboarding on a recycling bin. This was the beginning of creating your own skater, and you could call him Criff, who lives in the sink and is five years old. He also looks like this, but don't laugh at him. Criff is shy. This was where you could begin to use stat points that you earned in the campaign to max out all of your abilities and your balance sensitivity. This was where you could edit and customize your tricks. You could create and edit your own bloody, bloody, bloody parks. And how about the levels? There were more of them, they had a dump load more to do and far more secrets to see with environmental pieces to completely destroy with your sickness. They came with cash prizes that you could spend in the shop for more customization options. You could be hit by train, but more importantly, there were more tricks, which not only meant crazier scores, but way more ways to link them together with the ability to manual on the street and wall ride across vertical surfaces. And then there were the cheats. Oh lord, the cheats. You can believe you can fly, you can become a big boy, you can escape the game, you can go on the Atkins diet, but easily the coolest part, you could be Spider-Man. Look out! Here comes the Spider-Man. Wait, what? The judges only gave me 99.9? .9. What do you mean 99.9? .9? Did you see what I just did? That's not enough for a full score? At least give me a chicken nugget. Now don't get me wrong, I'm still not a fan of the two minute time limit for the career mode. You could argue that it's arcadey and challenging, but I argue it's restrictive, stressful, and doesn't let you fully take in or explore the brilliant level design. And if you just so happen to agree with me on that, then don't worry, because the Tony Hawk series eventually did get rid of it. They kept on being made. They kept on improving. Nobody could stop them. Not even my mum. And she could stop a freight train by frowning at it. You know what else is for preschoolers? Easter Bunny's Big Day. You know what the Easter Bunny's Big Day is? Easter. So if that's the mystery that this game has, I think I've solved it. One day, a rabbit was jumping around and thought to itself, Ah, you know what? I don't have enough eggs. And then all of a sudden, a robotic egg jumped out of the rabbit's basket and said, Oh, by the way, all you need to do to get more eggs is watch me walk around a badly compressed JPEG and complete minigames. And don't worry, if you can't solve any of these jigsaw puzzles, we won't give you a single chance to get it wrong, because here's where all the pieces go. Oh, what's that? This is still too hard for you? Well, then how about you press a button to let us solve the entire thing for you? What's the point of playing this game, then? I certainly expected more than just solving a million jigsaw puzzles and maybe playing two games of catch the egg or match the rabbit in the egg. Yes, rabbits lay eggs apparently. There are other disturbing implications in this game too, like where is the Easter Bunny during all of the game? Is he inside the robot egg? Was he liquidized and became the yolk? If the Easter Bunny's big day is Easter, which is only one day of the year, then why is he so unprepared and has no Easter eggs? Where do my extra Easter eggs come from when I solve a jigsaw puzzle? And for the love of God, tell me, what the hell is a zero rap? The content of this game doesn't just end at jigsaw saws and a few catching or matching games either. If you want, you can go back to the main menu and replay the jigsaws in any order that you want. Or you can look at the pictures of the jigsaw puzzles that you completed in the story mode but slightly bigger. If you don't want to do any of that though, at the end of the story mode, which will take you about 16 minutes, you have to wind up the robot because it dies, and then your reward for finishing everything is to watch the robot walk very slowly all the way to the school to give the Easter Bunny's egg sack to the good little boys and girls of Pissington Hill. Then there's party time with Winnie the Dump, a Mario Party ripoff where you pick up fruit, drive around in circles for three hours, spawn unlimited bananas from the back of your feet, and the game doesn't let you play as Eeyore because everyone left him behind in the Wicker Man. Oh look, it's Cash Banuka. That was alright wasn't it? Oh look, it's Cash Banuka 2. That was great, wasn't it? Oh look, it's Cash Banuka wrapped. Oh look, it's Cash Teat Rabies. But no matter how much people loved Crash 1, when Crash 2 came out and refined and improved basically everything, it was clear where the original should have been from the very beginning, and it looks kind of bad now. Because at the time, nobody knew any better. This type of game was a new thing in 1996, so people didn't 100% know how good this new gaming formula could possibly get until they experienced it for themselves. I mean, geez, as people played Pog in 1972 and they thought that video games had peaked. That's it guys, we're not getting any better than this. Pack up and go home. Wait, it's in colour now? And nowadays, we all know the original Crash trilogy is classic because they remade them and they still hold up brilliantly today. The same can even be said about Crash's first attempt of a kart racer. Fantastic then, and fantastic as a remake even now.
We also know these games are classics because its own series they came from really started pushing their luck when everyone started bitching about it. Now, where have I heard that before? Did someone call me? This is Walt Disney World Quest Magical Racing Tour, possibly the worst title of a game I've ever seen next to Golf Magazine Presents 36 Great Holes starring Fred Couples. We've had platformers, we've had side-scrolling action, we've had point and clicks, and now we've got a kart racer. So maybe this one will stick out for the right reasons. Time to pick my language, I guess. <gasps> But I'm French! Aha! Bon Jovi! Okay, well the game doesn't start all that good because Jesus is P-Bit. What is going on with Chip and Dale down here? Dale looks like Nosferatu and Chip has camel toe. Well, hello there! Ooh. Frick is the name. Jiminy Cricket. Okay, apparently Rattlesnake Dale wasn't scary enough for the kids because now we have this overly animated withered old peanut with a full set of human teeth. He is absolutely disgusting. Hello there! Ricketts the name. I've got rickets! Nice to meet you, Jiminy, and my name is... Suck. But luckily, that isn't because the game itself sucks. Far from it. It's the best I've played so far for this video. Well, most of the time. It's got everything you need for a kart racer. You've got power-ups, drifting with drift boosting, but specifically for hairpin turns. You can tap jump to make sudden sharp turns over and over again to keep your speed up. There's loads of shortcuts and alternate routes, and there's even some shortcuts that can only be activated once per lap by you needing to drive through all of these loops here and then aiming your car in the right place. Even the entire idea of the game itself is great. Its pre-title is Walt Disney World Quest for a reason, because all of the racetracks are based off of Disney World Ride and attractions, with the races themselves throwing tons of nods and references to what you see in the parks and rides themselves. Pirates of the Caribbean, Space Mountain, Rock and Roller Coaster, Thunder Mountain, Haunted Mansion, most of the big ones are all here and it's really cool to race through them. Then to make it even better, after you've picked your Disney reject that nobody remembers like Otto Plugnut or... Oliver Chickley the third. Every racetrack actually changes the vehicle you're driving to match the theme of the track that you're on. Whether you're using a train in Thunder Mountain or a rocket ship in Space Mountain, it's details like that I have a right fit over. And they even use some of the classic Disney World background music for some of these racetracks. But then you run into those kinds of issues where for every good thing you find, there's unfortunately a catch. The track designs are interesting, but you'll often get clipped to the edges of walls. The shortcuts are plentiful, but sometimes you'll break the game and be told that you're going the wrong way when you're clearly following the arrows. And then there's stuff that outright confuses me. Why would they include all of these different vehicle types, but then not give zombie Grandpa Donald and all of his friends their own stats for costs and benefits to make the races more interesting and the racers stick out more? This game also came out after CTR and Diddy Kong Racing. Would it have killed them to have a drive around hub world where you actually go and explore Disney World itself? And what about the slowdown? Biggest problem with this game though, is that it's just not that special. It's functional, I like the tracks, but there's really not that much I can say about it. It's as standard as a kiddie kart racer goes. Not much depth to it whatsoever. Lego Rock Raiders, another PS1 game and one that I haven't played until this video. Kids tested, kids approved. Yeah, well, the kids also like shitting their pants, so that doesn't mean anything. Oh, interesting. We get to pick a mission here. Let's see. Uh, awesome. But the story of Rock Raiders is that you are a rescue team that raids rocks, I suppose, and one day, unfortunately, the teapot pad lies on the other side of an underground river, so off we go to save the miserable brown day. I was taken aback by this mission select, though. You essentially can pick what you want to do in any order you want in order to unlock the final level. It's basically Mega Man, but instead of looking blocky, it is blocky. And here is the game. Um... Uh Okay, uh, what the hell am I supposed to be doing here? You are given no indication on how to play or what's even going on, so all I can do right now is walk around forever, wondering why even though I picked a guy with hair, I'm now all of a sudden bald. So is this a strategy game or something? What's with this unsettling top-down view? Whoa, I can jump! So that must mean that this isn't a strategy game because I can move and jump? What's going on here? So apparently I need to find some rocks to power this thing. Gotcha. Uh, are there any over here? No. Are there any over here? No. Are there any over here? No, what, what? You see these scorpions here? They hurt you. By the time you're even able to aim properly at these things, you've lost all your ammo and you've taken around four or five hits extra trying to kill them because of how fast they move. Wait, what, what am I doing here? Am I lip flapping on the walls? I still have no clue what I'm doing. The R1 button gives us a scanning view at least, but why are these rocks a slightly lighter green than these other rocks? Is this a glitch? I don't know anymore. Maybe if I lip flap nice and hard against those parts, something funny's gonna happen. Oh, I can break them. Oh, well, thanks for letting me know, Lego p 
cock blockers? How the hell was I supposed to figure that out? There's no indication you're even doing anything. Not even a sound effect. Yes, they expected you to figure out, without any sound effects or anything, to stand there and hold one button for that long to progress. Let's try another mission then, see if it's any different. Oh, look at that. It isn't. Oh, okay, now there's a sound effect. Oh, whoa, look at this. We've got some water over here. Should we jump into it? Uh, I want to see what happens. Yeah, next mission. And this mission sees us stuck with a very tight time limit while having to dig through multiple rock walls that all take 15 seconds each to dig through. And most of them don't lead to anything that I actually need, wasting a huge chunk of my minuscule time limit. Mission aborted, yeah? Well, this game will be if it keeps pissing me off! Next mission then, and it's more of exactly the same, except now, after spending two minutes standing still and digging, I ended up making a loop back around to the start of the level, which didn't help me at all. I'm sorry, I can't keep going on with this. Lego Rock Raiders is one of the most thoroughly joyless and confusing messes I've ever played. And why do I even need to go out and collect rocks to power this bloody thing? We're underground in a cavern! Since a lot of the console users in the mainstream at the time weren't massive computer whizzes, that meant that CDs were not only far easier than floppy disks to physically replicate for manufacturing, but also meant that the average user didn't have the knowledge to do anything bad with the disks, copy them or repurpose them for reselling. Besides, there was too much data on these discs to upload all of them for free on the internet like what early shareware allowed you to do anyway. Even if people could do all of this though, the effort wouldn't be worth it anyway, because these demos didn't offer enough content for each individual game on the discs, but offered just enough with the amount of games on them that the demo disc being a free gift along with a gaming publication made it a sure, why not kind of purchase. And that, for gaming advertising, was a gold mine. Why do I have two copies of Disc 58? And you even got to keep your very own physical souvenir with exclusive artwork on the sleeves. They're nothing crazy, but definitely unique. They're like little plastic postcards. Dear Mum, having a nice time. Wish you were here. Where are you? And that's why I've kept all of these ones collected by other family members over the years, because they're like little photographs of the past. They take me right back. Like the time that Metal Gear Solid was the best game on the planet, the time when animated pit crews were an exciting game feature, and the time where disgusting sticky old men thought that a load of polygons were hotter than their own wives. Let's do some tumbling. It was like having a miniature PlayStation museum of games on your shelves. In fact, I've replayed all of these demos so many times, the discs themselves are buggered beyond belief. Or they would just stop and boot you back to the main menu immediately. <laughs> A woman getting into a car, that's all I need. I'm gonna buy the game now. Thrasher's Skate and Destroy for the PS1. But what do I pick on the main menu? Options, options, or Skate, Skate? And what character do I want to pick? Um... Uh, scab? Oh god, your parents must have hated you. I'm choosing you based on that name alone. Oh, and I can make you shirtless? But then we'll see all of your scabs! What's my name? Well, you know what? You can't improve on perfection, so I'm gonna keep it as scab. Now, this game is great. Wanna know why? Well, first of all, it's because you don't only push your board with the X button and that's all it does, but it's also because each button on the controller corresponds to a different trick. You ollie with square, but kickflip with triangle and 180 spin with circle. Yes, instead of ollieing and spinning yourself around with the D-pad or the shoulder buttons, you press a single button that spins for you. Sound confusing? Well, wait until you get involved with these stages then. Oh boy. This is as barren and basic as you can get. You only need to get the set amount of points and then exit the level. That's it. The problem is though, because something as simple as a kickflip has its own dedicated button, I can't figure out for the life of me how to grind. I just keep pressing any button after I ollie to see if I snap onto a ledge, but nothing works and I end up turning into an electrocuted crab. Right, can I try that again? Oh no, you're just gonna fall off the board before I even move. Thank you. Why have I put my trust into someone called Scab? Oh, and by the way, the levels have their own exit points that you can accidentally just ride into because there's nothing I love more in a skating game than leaving the level in the middle of a combo. Oh, look at that. That's exactly how I sleep when I'm having a nice dream. And then all of a sudden the game can completely changes perspectives to a police officer with a taser chasing me. What? How do I see what I'm doing if the camera is nowhere near me? Where am I? What's the point of this camera angle? I'm not controlling the policeman, so what's going on? Wait, wait, I failed the mission because I lost the cops? Isn't that the entire idea? I'm not looking for an internship at the police station. I'm a skater boy who says, see you later, boy. Okay, let's try grinding again, and I don't know, I'm out of ideas. Should I just try pressing the board pushing button? <laughs> 
You're kidding. So let me get this straight. You press the X button to start pushing your board, then hold one of these three buttons to ready yourself, let go of the button to do the jump trick, and then press the push button again to grind. What is it with Tony Hawk ripoffs and never ripping off what made the game so enjoyable in the first place? This is gormless. Who wants to sit there and learn all of these stupid specific actions just to do a single trick that takes two button presses in any other skating game? You can't snap onto the rails either. No, you have to land on them perfectly while pressing the push button because we've got to be realistic in our skating game with edges of curbs that push you backwards and ragdoll physics. Hey, how are you doing? Okay, I hear the sirens coming. It's time to leave the level before the game turns into the police version of Doom. And I lost anyway. Cool. Thanks again, scab. And I'm really loving this noise that won't stop repeating itself in the background. It sounds like someone's having a stroke and not the bad kind. <laughs> Skate and destroy. Where was the destruction? Yes, my Disney kitchen, which on its own sounds like a total nightmare right out of the gate. What does it mean if your kitchen is a Disney kitchen? Oh. Believe it or not, this PS1 game was exclusive to Japan and America. The UK never got it, but that's probably because the only cuisine we have are room temperature water and mushy peas. However, I do so happen to have a region free hacked PS2, so I have no excuses. Let's check it out. Just before we start though, I need to say that the cover art is very problematic. If Stitch was so much of a feminist he couldn't even touch a woman, Mickey is the stark opposite. <laughs> Minnie is the busy one, working the toaster, pouring the milk, flipping the pancakes and mixing the batter, while Mickey just sits there like a gluttonous bigot waiting to be fed. Okay, here we go, my Disney kitchen. And the E in kitchen is slightly wonky. Oh look, there's Minnie, and what a surprise, she's going for the cheese. Honestly, I didn't know what to think about anything going on here, so I left it too long on the title screen, which led me to a demo video. And the very first thing that popped up were the words heavy cream. <gasps> what an adorable house. I don't like this. Why are they looking inside my house? Is this the purge? Oh, Jesus H, Mother of Mary, they broke in. And their voices aren't right. We'd be happy to run to the grocery store for you. <laughs> and we'd be happy to, to drop by. Oh, trying a bit of role play, are we? Well, why don't you pretend to tell me how your day went and I pretend to care? Why is the toaster not plugged in? Why is the kitchen table photo realistic? Why are the words my Disney kitchen posted completely straight while the frame that they're on is at an angle? Why do I have a sensual Mickey portrait on the wall? Why is the mouse cursor so slow even with the speed button held down. Oh look, I found the fridge. And yes, I even found the world famous heavy cream. But more disturbingly, the tomato puree was right next to it. This is starting to sound like a bad time of the month. So we can pick up any ingredients we want and put them down again. That's good. But what can I do with this pasta? Fine, we'll do it properly then. Let's get the pot, put in the pasta, and an orange, chocolate syrup, and a pickle. Brilliant, supper will be ready in no time flat. Unfortunately though, you can't put ice cream in it because that's going too far. There we go, it's all heated through. Time to put it on the table for Mickey and Minnie to eat. They'll be fine. Rats will eat anything. <gasps> oh no, rain. It's an omen. Why won't Mickey and Minnie come and try my delicious slop? How dare you not try my cooking? I'm a master baker! Okay, so clearly, if you want to play this game, you need to have a basic understanding of cooking. This is not a free-for-all, this is not about having fun. It's a game for parents trying to turn their four-year-old into a housewife. You need to know what tools to use where, what ingredients go together, what to do with what ingredient in what order. If you like cooking, then congratulations, because that's all that this is. And I hate it. It's far too much effort for me to go through to make fake food that I can't even eat. Wait, what? I didn't want to open up a breakfast bar. Okay, game. Fine. If you won't try my food, I will. I, I, I didn't mean it. I, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to try this. Okay. Oh, can't even get it into the orange. Ah. That's good enough for Mickey Mouse! Oh, okay, my mistake. I was too busy learning how to domesticate my children with cooking lessons to remember that you need to plate up your meals before the mice will eat them. Silly me. Mickey, if you don't shut up, you're going in the curry. Well, I couldn't figure out how to put all of my other ingredients into a single bowl, so instead, you can have a pickle on a plate. I call it... Le Pickle Platy.
And it comes with a knife when you want to end it all. Annoyingly though, even after all of this, they still don't want to eat my food. They refuse to go near a single lonely pickle without me putting actual food from the recipe book on the table first. Okay, fair enough, whatever. So I look up how to make a cake, head for the oven to make it, sort the batter out, bake it in the oven, and burn it. So now it looks like human waste. Let's put Donald's face on it. Yeah, there we go. Donald's dump. That cake looks quite interesting. <laughs> Eat up, kids. I'm sure you'll love it. <laughs> oh, this is delicious. <laughs> oh, boy. Just wait until Donald hears about the time we ate his feces. Part one. Purple is gay. Right, so first off, no matter if you like Spyro or hate his guts, you cannot deny the iconic status of this box art. This color scheme, this art style, it's so PlayStation. It is perfect. I wouldn't change a thing about it. Why is that there? The story of Spyro 1 is that the press have gone over to the Dragon Realms to interview the dragons about a wretched old boil known as Nasty Nork, and they decide to make fun of him on live TV. Besides, he is ugly. Got a real Kanye West over it. Now, how did Nasty hear that savage diss all the way from his house? Well, you have to remember, this was way back in the 90s and everybody thought TVs worked like telephones. Don't forget, TVs had only been around for 70 years. Because of that, Nasty Nork casts a crystallizing spell on every dragon in the kingdom, except for Spyro, because... Uh, luckily for us though, Spyro is purple, and purple is a sick color. Everything purple kicks ass, which means Spyro runs off to kick ass, which means the game itself would inevitably kick ass. Except his voice. That that doesn't really kick anything aside from my face. What about Nasty Nork? I'm going after him. Is it because of his color? Did they give him a chain-smoking teenager's voice because no one would think he was cool for being purple? That's outrageous. Some of the best things in life are purple, like bruises and... Ringworm. Destiny? I just want to kick some- Just toast those enemies and collect the treasure! See, kids? Spyro is cool! He nearly said bottom! In Simon 1, you skip around luscious open environments unless the game stops you with the big, big shapes. shapes. Smashing all of your nan's china with your head, gliding from island to island, setting sheep on fire, occasionally fighting a boss, cracking open old men- Run! Run! and eventually run off to Nasty's lair to spit roast him. That Nasty Nork is toast. And honestly, that's kind of it. This is a fairly standard collectathon platformer from the time. Find as many gems, dragon eggs, and crystallized perverts as possible in order to unlock more hub worlds to find as many gems, dragon eggs, and crystallized perverts as possible. But Simon does have some tricks up his sleeve to stick out above your Banjo Kazooies and your Super Martins. Let's a go, Yahoo! In case you didn't notice, Spyro is a dragon, and that means he has five unique things that make the game work entirely on their own. One, dangly skin. Simon not only jumps like every other knobhead, but by hitting jump again can use the loose parts of his back to glide long distances. This isn't only an extremely fun and liberating thing to do in every Spyro game, but allows the level design to focus not just on horizontal flat landscapes. Now you can have giant, sprawling, and tall levels based on verticality. You see that glimmering secret pile of treasure far out there? Well, if you get yourself high enough somewhere else in that level, and not from a weed, you may be able to reach it. It's not even a case of you finding the one single place to cross that one single gap turning the glide function into a situational invisible bridge either. You can glide off of any surface in any direction, which means the designers can hide more secrets in more creative places and gives you a breathtaking sense of freedom and adventure in each level, which can also be tense as hell. Whenever I'm about to make a risky looking glide, I always have this inner fear of, oh my god, I want that stuff over there, but is my glide going to be high enough to reach it? Well, I guess there's only one way to find out, so here I go. But once I'm gone, I'm committed, so I have to be confident. Oh god, I'm not gonna make it. Who? bad breath. Instead of any clumsy jumps or precise melee attacks, Simon uses a wide, close-range fire breath attack to kill the enemy Norks or break open baskets for gems. Not only a really fun thing to do, but it looks cool, leaves little black ashes behind, and basically guarantees a hit if you're facing the general direction of the breath since it has such a wide girth. 3. The horn. Simon can use his horns for even more utility than the flame breath. It can break metal vases and baskets, attack basic norks no problem, and gives you a speed boost which makes basic running around much more thrilling and quick. Four. Whirlwinds. If you jump into a whirlwind, the camera moves downwards and lets you look right up Spyro's five. Small thing that isn't a dragon and has nothing to do with dragons at all. That wispy little skinny lemon is Sparks the Dragonfly, and he is your health bar somehow. Yellow means you've got four hits left, blue is three hits left, green is two hits left, gone is one hit left, and then... <laughs> you keep yourself healthy by murdering smaller creatures that have no ways of fighting back, just like in real life. But honestly, I couldn't care less about health points. I just want Sparks to look yellow as often as possible, because blue and yellow look like spoiled cheese. I don't want Sparks to look ill, so I give him as many butterflies as possible. 
animal. I will even go all the way back to the beginning of an empty level to top him up if I have to. No small animal is too far away for me to gut. But here's where things get interesting. On their own, the moves that Spyro can pull off are pretty sweet. But when you mix them together... Whoa. You get big enemies that can only be flamed and armored enemies that can only be charged with your horns. Then you get enemies that are too big to charge but also armored from your flame so a new weakness needs to be discovered. You get collectible dragon eggs that are stolen by thieves that are too quick to be flamed so need to be charged towards all over the level while they go... <laughs> This noise triggers my stomach acids. You get supercharge panels on the floor to make your charge get faster and faster the more time you spend on the panels, and the more time you spend on the panels, the further your jump and glide becomes. Yeah, most people hate it, but you're all morons. Sure, it takes me a few attempts to remember the roots, and I die a few times every time I come back to it after a while, but the satisfaction of finding the correct starting point of a supercharge panel, jumping over to another island to keep gaining speed on another supercharge panel, and then making that one final gigantic glide over to the hardest to reach area of the whole game is ingenious and incredible to get right. I even like the little balance things going on with how you control Spyro, like flame breathing, for example, being an easier and safer attack to do against baskets and enemies, but the trade-off for that is that everything is slower and the gems that drop from them float up into the air and fall loose. But if you try and go for a risky charge attack as much as possible, you'll find it's not only faster, but then the gems will follow immediately after you once you break the basket or kill the enemy. I even love how you can charge different barrels towards the end of the game to attack the- <gasps> And you get those one-off bonus levels for each world that turns the game into a free-flying time trial of destruction. These will be known from now on as Speedways. This is the reason people still love the original Spyro PS1 series even until today. It's the fine mix of all of these moves to make the series a blast to play, with a couple of extra references to other games for good measure. I always believed in you, Spyro. You gotta believe. The charm of the world around you is off the charts too, and there's so much detail put into the tiniest things. If you charge into a bull instead of flaming it, it'll get stuck in the ground by its horns. If you move up a steep hill, Simon's walk cycle changes. Set fire to cacti and watch them shake the ashes off. Watch enemies capture smaller creatures and then get too distracted celebrating to attack you. Seriously though, there are norks everywhere and nearly every single level gives you a different variant of them, which the game really didn't need to do. There's norks with swords, norks with clubs, norks with flags, norks with tasers, norks with guns. Norks with guns. Easy does it, easy does it. Also, I'm British. Which means you probably hate me, but it also means that I love saying the word norks. The hills have norks, the castles have norks, the harbours have norks, the fairies have norks. <laughs> You know what's sad as well? In the Reignited Trilogy remake, they got rid of the norks with guns and replaced them with purple water pistols. Oh, come on now. What? You don't like seeing guns in your video games? What are you? A a, a cuck woke. And hey, I may really dislike Spyro's voice in this game, but the other dragons you rescue are another thing entirely. Spyro, my friend, how about a hint on gliding? I love all of these guys. They're only ever on screen for like five seconds each, but they're the most memorable part of the game for me. Ever since you're a wee puff of smoke, we've known, uh, ah, I forget. They mostly serve as hints and tips when you find them, even though the hints are all horrible. Big enemies like this Gnork with the club cannot be charged, but a quick flame, that should defeat them. Yes, I already killed that guy to rescue you. What are you talking about? Did you know that you get your longest glides by pressing X at the very top of your jump? How do you think I got here? Flame won't harm metal, but charging with your horns, that should do the trick. This is world two. I've been doing this for the last six levels. Are you senile? Be careful, Spyro. This boss has many tricks up his sleeve. What does that mean? The best line in the entire game, though, easily goes to Cletus. My man Cletus. What does he say? Spyro, it's great to see you, but I've got to go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye then. You know what all of the dragon's favorite thing is to say though? Thank you for releasing me. I swear that most of these smelly lizards say this line on repeat, and by the end of the game, nearly every single one of them says it. You want to see how many I found? Thank you for releasing me. 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 But don't worry, not all of them say thank you.
Some of them say thanks. Thanks for releasing me. Yeah, despite my accolades, I actually don't think Spyro 1 is that great, mainly because of how primitive and stripped back it feels, especially compared to the sequels, which isn't Spyro 1's fault, but I'm blaming him anyway. You know, it's weird. It always surprises me when I remember that the first Spyro came out in 1998. This wasn't an early PlayStation title, and yet I think it feels like one. There's just something missing. I can't explain it. There's no gimmicks, no major surprises. I mean, I do love simplicity and games that are to the point, but with cartoony collectathon Johnny John Spyro the Johnson, the simplicity holds it back for me. Especially when you compare it to the following games, Spyro 1 feels really plain, just like how Crash 1 feels compared to Crash 2. And by 1998, Crash 3 had already perfected the Crash formula, whereas Spyro was just getting his feet wet. And when Spyro gets his feet wet, he dies. The collectathon gameplay loop is pretty basic and it gets a bit samey for me after World 2 with not much variety in what you actually do aside from more dangerous glides and slightly different enemies. And for as much as I love the visual style, the presentation itself also gets a little bit too samey for me. Aside from that, Oh, these things can get royally shitted off too. What are these things? Why do they look like that? No matter how many times I replay this game, I can never remember the names of levels or tell them apart by screenshots. They just don't leave much of a lasting impact on me. I don't think there's anything entertaining or that endearing about the characters and story. Spyro's voice, I think I smell a barbecue, makes me want to shit down a chimney. The sound effects feel really wet and sloppy without much impact or crunch. The charge controls are pretty damn loose and slippery. Glide can sometimes feel really heavy that doesn't always make its target even when you feel like it should. And then there's all the little things that add up over the course of the game. You hit these and then jump over them to get the gems. Why? It's awkward. If you miss it, you just do it again. These things you breathe fire on over and over again until they pop, pointless. Then you have the soundtrack, composed by one of my favorite drummers of all time, Stuart Copeland. It's a soundtrack beloved by basically everyone. And I think it's... Yeah? Yes, it's that Stuart Copeland, the drummer from the all-time classic rock band, The Policeman. And look, I don't hate the music, it's good music, but I don't get the undying love for this game's soundtrack in particular. I think it's way too spacious and meandering for the kind of game that this is. And if you tied a rope around my neck and asked me to match which songs go with what levels or else you'll hang me, I'd say, I don't know. <laughs> But then I'd say that anyway, because I don't mind this. Don't get me wrong though, when the visuals and music come together into a gourmet, creamy cereal, it's downright incredible. My go-to example being Dark Hollow in World 1. But as a whole, I just don't dig the soundtrack that much. It's well constructed, it's well performed, and there are some great tracks here. I just can't remember most of it, and I don't think it matches the gameplay that well. And these bosses, oh, oh these bosses, these absolute garbage fire F tier bosses, F for very stinky. These are the worst parts of the game for me. They aren't bosses, they're regular levels that are really small with slightly stronger enemies that I wouldn't let near a school. First boss, Toasty. He's a scarecrow that is actually a sheep on stilts. Hit him three times, he does nothing. These regular dog enemies are more dangerous than him. Second boss, Dr. Shemp. Hit his back after jumping over like two attacks. Third boss, Blowhard. More like blow chunks. Fourth boss, Metalhead. Charge into metal poles that aren't electrified. You win. Boss 5, Jacques. Do some platforming and then question why the hell he has a regular French name. Final boss, Nasty Nork, is sadly just as easy to kill as any other regular Nork. You chase him, he does nothing, you win. When the edge of the walkway is more threatening than the final boss, you know you've ballsed it. At least you got a pretty sweet reward for 100% in the game though. You get access to Nasty's loot. The only actual free-flying level where you just explore everywhere, blow up everything, and steal all of his treasure. Thanks for the stimulus check, Nasty Bro. Then the credits roll. Ah, oh, nostalgia. You know, even though this isn't my favorite Spyro game and I do have problems with it, I do like it a lot still to this day. I enjoy this game, and every time I reach this credit sequence and hear this music and watch all the low poly flyby level camera stuff going on, it lets me know that I made a good choice in picking up this game to replay it again. No sheep were harmed during the creation of this game. Spyro 1 is a classic, no doubt. But at the end of the day, even though I've got a lot of nostalgia for it, this is not the game that I replay whenever I feel like a bit of him. It's better than Crash 1 for a first attempt, but it still feels like a first attempt. Now this, this is what I call a video game. Why is there a hairy circle? My name is, um, 
Bra. I don't know, what do you want from me? This is a game from the animated storybook series of Disney games. Interactive moving slideshows that retell the Disney movie that you picked and that allows you to mess around with each chapter as you go on with mini games. The only one of these games that made the leap from PC to PS1 though was... Mullen. Water mull, does that mean that this was the best one? And that they needed to put it on as many platforms as possible? I have a pair of leggings. What do you think? To be fair though, this is just exactly the same as the other ones available on the PC. It's a retelling of Disney's Mulan, except you make it move along, choose your own words for the story like Summoned, Challenged, Dared. Play a mini game every so often, and click around on absolutely everything to see what happens. <laughs> You can slap a skinny man. You can make a cat wet. You can scroll through a few words at a million miles an hour. You can dress up Mulan to make her look like a homeless woman in a towel. You can make Mushu laugh. <laughs> but don't make Mushu laugh. And you can even send off an endless supply of prearranged wives off to a miserable future. Seriously, this never stops. Where are all these women coming from? Family. Family. Where you kiss your mum and your dad. But we wish Granny would just die already. Mulan arrived at the army camp. She had trouble fitting in with the other soldiers. Well, I bet they didn't have any trouble fitting in her. I'm busy. I need an apple for serenity for Mulan. Okay, no sweat. A please would be nice, but I don't want you to break my nose, so I'll go and get it for you. No, it's the green apple I need. Jesus, sorry. I want you to get a pendant for balance for Mulan. Aha, gotcha. Easy peasy. No, I need the purple and yellow pendant. Uh... Jade beads, bring them to me after you've found them. Now stacked! Fine, I'm on it. No, no, I- Oh, shut up, you smelly old bat! You know I'd be able to do all of this if you told me what you actually wanted first. Don't blame me for guessing, and stop staring at me like a bulldog chewing on a wasp! I need to take a bath and get dressed. So why don't you? Do you need help? The matchmaker awaits you! Yes, dressmaker. I cannot wait to get dressed before taking a bath in my new dress. I hope I make a beautiful bride. Well, you better quickly give birth to one then. The most important thing to me, though, is that they even included the best Disney song of all time. I mean, do you want an animated and interactive storybook of Disney's Mulan? Then play the animated interactive storybook of Disney's Mulan. It does what it says on the tid, so leave me alone. <laughs> I think I know how to do this now. Yes, so do I. Have a brush. Next up, we have Barbie Explorer. Action as never before. Oh, wow. Does that mean that Barbie might bend her elbows? And would you look at that? She's actually doing more than using her joints. Check out this epic minecart video sequence. This is some dangerous stuff here. Barbie is looking like she's loving it. She looks pretty excited about death. So in this game, Barbie has taken it upon herself to find the missing pieces of a mystic mirror. Why? No clue. I thought she'd be too worried about breaking a nail. But if anything, I'm a little bit confused as to why we're in the middle of a story all about a mystical power that will reawaken and most definitely end humanity if we find all the pieces of an ancient artifact. This is a Barbie game, right? Hang on, sunshine. What do we have here? VR training? What, like in Metal Gear Solid? Watch out, world! Solid Barbara's coming through! Now, in virtual reality, you can do all sorts of things with Barbie, like teleport onto swinging vines, walk like an old lady with rickets, not jump onto climbable walls because god forbid we put any actual fun into our platformer, and then we get absolutely decked in the face by opening doors. What's my name this time? KFC. Because by the looks of it, Barbie could do with one. She looks like if she pushes too hard, she'll snap her legs like a stick. So when we get into the actual game, I'm absolutely shocked to find out that it isn't very good. To begin with, this basically feels like the original Tomb Raider. You don't have tank controls, but everything else you do from climbing to jumping has an abysmal delay to it, which would be fine if the game itself was built around it and wasn't a fast-paced linear corridor platformer like Crash Bandicoot. You try playing a game like Crash where you don't only have Tomb Raider delay but also a jump arc that you are so committed to once you do it, you basically already had kids with it by the time you land. I mean, it makes sense, everything here has a purpose, but it's easily the stiffest platformer I've ever played. Bubsy 3D isn't this stiff, and at least Bubsy has more directions he can move towards so that his body doesn't constantly clip on angled parts of the wall and make Barbie bring out her funeral fashion pack. I mean, what else do you want me to say? Barbie looks like she has a moustache, there's no sound effects at all while she's pulling rocks that weigh as much as a truck, she outright absorbs herself into the walls, and please tell me, where are you going, Barbie? Egypt, Africa. Egypt is in Africa. But then again, judging by your face, I don't think geography is your strong point. This is a game starring Barbie, all about Barbie, in an action-adventure game with awful controls. I mean, I really can't go into any more... 
I'm so sorry, these games are really getting me going. So do you want to know how to ruin somebody's day in two steps? It's easy. Step one, give them Shrek Treasure Hunt on PS1. And step two, remind them about Blue Waffle. Right off the bat, I'm not exactly a fan of Fiona's face right here. She looks like she just realised who she shares a bed with. Oh, hey, no, 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 get out of there, Tomb Raider. Shrek's got some treasure to find. Okay, so as it turns out, the person I eBayed this game from didn't look after the disc very well. I don't know why. But because of that, all the cutscenes are a little bit... <laughs> terrible. It's okay, though, because we can still get to the menus, and judging by this music... It sounds like we're off to Shrek's funeral. Maybe the intro cutscene won't be as balked as the other ones, though. I feel optimistic, so what's the story here? Princess Fiona arrived. Oh. She did. And you know what? The funeral procession song at the start menu was fitting because this game is dead on arrival. My lord, this frame rate. Is this a video game or a book? I'm stunned that this looks and runs as poor as it does for a PS1 game released in 2002. But that doesn't matter because I've got 10 blocks of cheese to find. This then unlocks a room for me to go into in order to play a mini game. And the name of this mini game is Purgatory because it never actually loaded. And this drowning bug in the corner was left to slowly die in its own filth forever. Voila! Oh, we're in, and aren't I glad I finally got it working? No, because this game is my armpit. Shrek for the PS1 is a weird platforming party game hybrid, where in the platforming moments you can run and jump. No, that's it. Enemy coming your way? Tough luck, sunshine, you can't attack back. But then again, they can't really hurt you either, they just kind of knock you to the floor. What's the point of any of these sections? I really don't know. You collect items to unlock more mini games, but since the item collecting part is a smelly pit of nothing where you can't do anything and take so long to collect anything, it might as well just be a level select. And I'd rather it be a level select because this part of the game is as appealing as soap scum. Even if you took this part of the game away though, it ultimately doesn't matter. The mini games you unlock are at best unimaginable imaginative and at worst totally wretched. From copying simple button presses to moving your cursor over to a ripple in the water to catch fish and reel them in. Very slowly. Nine times. This is one of the worst games I've ever played, and I'm not even exaggerating. Just to give you an idea how unenjoyable this whole package is, you could spend up to 15 minutes wandering aimlessly around this jittery wasteland with no obstacles to avoid, looking for random items, only to unlock a terrible minigame that lasts all of 20 seconds, and then you're back at the slideshow again. But at least there's a button you can hold to walk in case the whole thing wasn't moving slowly enough for you! Or you could do exactly the same thing and then be treated to a minigame that lasts yet another 15 minutes. Not because it's deep or fun, but because it just doesn't get to the point. Oh look, Shrek has something to tell me. What's that? Oh great, this frame rate is making me ill. I can't be the only one getting eye ache here, can I? Why did they release this in the state that it's in? Before we get into the game, can I just say one thing? I never watched this show, but the movie Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, as far as a cheap spin-off goes, I really like. It's pretty funny, actually. And appropriately, the video game tie-in is also making me laugh, but not in the right way. We pick our first mission and get treated to a phone call, which I honestly zoned out from because this dude just kept saying the same words over and over again. Get away, spot. 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 I think I'm going to the getaway spot. Oh, look, it's a scene from the show. That's pretty cool, at least. Light year could handle this one in hypersleep. Ooh, bye. So Star Command on the PS1 is a corridor running and gunning game, and when I say that, I mean that's all you do. You run, jump, and gun, with floaty as heck controls and one of the worst camera systems I've ever seen that can't be controlled. But there are a few other things you can do. You can collect hidden little green men for extra bonuses, you can pick up and collect credits to buy new upgrades and weapons throughout the level, and you can strafe left and right, but <laughs> what is this? It's good to know that I'm now playing the video game adaptation of Disney on Ice. You've also got to fight bosses and arrest them. But I don't think there's much point arresting a dead body on fire. That's not all though, because what is this? Why, it's a time limit, because this is also a racing game too. Yes, in order to get to the boss of each level, you need to reach its get getaway spot before the time runs out, or beat them to the hideout to knock off a portion of their health with this thing that looks like a blue toilet brush. And this is great whenever you find a shortcut portal or jet board, but terrible for looking around for collectibles and grabbing them. Not just the aliens, but the credits too, which you need to grab to buy the weapons you need to even damage the boss in the first place when you get there. And after all of this, the bosses usually amount to... Oh. 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 No. 
absolutely brilliant. These two styles of gameplay are at odds with each other constantly in Star Command. You need to find the hidden things and collect enough credits to get extra medals in order to progress, but you also need to do that while not running out of time, meaning potentially rushing by basically everything, and you haven't really got a chance to let the game itself or its level design sink in, so if you have to retry it, you don't really remember where the best places to go are, where the best weapons are, where the collectibles are, it's just really messy. It's not awful, but I wouldn't exactly describe it as fun, and it's not that difficult, more just irritating. Not helped at all by the total lack of camera control, and no weapon lock-on! Even when the levels do get a little bit more interesting, like on Planet Flambe, it doesn't give you breathing room to search around it, or discover more interesting platforming or secrets, because otherwise you'll game over from being too far behind. Check out level 3 here, where I'm supposed to hit all of these bombs, or else they'll detonate and destroy the whole level, but I'm given a jet board really early on because of how fast this joker is, so I ended up missing one of the bombs in the level as I was heading for a shortcut which I thought I was supposed to do, but nah, because I missed that bomb which was on the corner of the screen, game over. All because Star Command can't make up its mind on what kind of game it wants to be. And when I finally did perform everything correct on this level, I accidentally activated a power-up for Booster who looks like a giant beat to come down and smash everything, causing the bad guy to get ahead of me, which means that the level itself never pauses, which means if my countdown clock was running, I might have lost the level right there completely out of my control. Why does Buzz have a gun anyway? He uses a laser in the movie and he has one on his arm. Where is it here? And why does he sound like Joe Swanson? Stop right there, Creepazoid. So what do you do if you're a skater and you want to play a skateboarding game, but you've had enough of Tony Hawk? I don't know. You play another game and get another random guy in it, like with MTV Sports Skateboarding featuring Andy McDonald. Finally, two of my favourite things together. MTV and Andy McDonald had a farm. And if you don't know who Old McDonald is, don't worry, because there's 14 other pro skaters to choose from, like Colin McKay, Rick Howard, Heidi Fitzgerald, and Rob Durde. Dark Black. Well, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? I mean, you can't get a light black, can you? What's my name? Um... Imps. But as we will soon see, you can even pick between a load of original characters for the story mode, like Jason Case, Steve Seagull, and David Wastebasket. And then you've got my personal favourite, Anna Graham, who left her dinner on her face. I think though I'm going to pick Wendy Jones for the good balance stats, and away we go. Whoa, hey there lady, I think you should go to the doctors, you've got a nasty looking CD growth on your chest. Okay, so this game may be taking the same ideas as Tony Hawk, but I would say it was only in the naming. Andy McDonald feels like it keeps nearly everything the same as a Tony Hawk game, yet adds in new methods of inputting tricks to avoid copyright infringement. So like, instead of holding a direction button down and then pressing an action button to activate a grab, flip or a grind, you hold the action button down first and then press a direction to perform the trick. Which wouldn't be too bad, aside from the fact that this control delay is shocking. Not even kidding, check this out. Caddy no likey. It's basically a Tony Hawk ripoff, but moves at the speed of an oil extraction. By the time the game even registers a trick, you've already flopped on the floor and died. I've got to say though, the booing is a little unnecessary, especially when most of the time I go straight up a ramp and the game bails me for absolutely no reason. Why are you booing me? I went up in a straight line and Andy McDonald <laughs> pushed me off my board. Are you booing me or the game? No big surprise here, but I did end up failing, and then I got this timeless bit of advice. You should try staying on the skateboard, and just for that sentence, I'm quitting the game forever. Bye bye, Andy. Andy McDonald. Old McDonald had a farm. What do you mean he had a farm? Where did it go? Oh yes, Pooh. Did you know that Winnie the Pooh had a surprising amount of PlayStation titles? No. But I do know that there was a point and click Winnie the Pooh education game for really young kids on the PlayStation. So let's jump on eBay and see what we can find. Can't afford these prices. I'm not a locksmith. Would you rather take your kid to a private school or pay for Winnie the Pooh as a teacher? Because it more or less costs the same. Furthermore, it's not even in my language. I'm not paying £300 for Winnie the Pooh educativi. What other Disney PS1 games can I look at instead? Oh. Apparently one is a Disney game. You forgot, didn't you? I've got a region free PS2. So I can play Winnie the Pooh Kindergarten instead. Yay, let's go on an adventure with Winnie Bear and Kinder Eggs. Well, I will say one thing about this title screen. Winnie can't wait to start going to school. You look exactly how I feel. We've got a menu here with lots of different mini games to see. And I am not a fan at all of all this jittering. Why is the game doing this? I'm not trying to find out if my kids got epilepsy. I'm trying to make them spell yak. I need to get away from this right now. It's really hurting my eyes. So let's start off with Pooh's thoughtful spot. You might want to check that it isn't malignant. Move here to choose the sky and over here to choose the ground. Oh, okay. Understood. 
I'm basically God. And this is where God lives. Welcome to the forest of tar. Next up is Rue's number balloons. And this is where it starts getting hard. You click on the balloons to pop them and then click on the number of balloons that you saw. Slow down. My, my tummy's having motions. You're the best balloon counter I know. How many do you know? Have you been having an affair? Let's check out Eeyore's Mix and Match. It's a music game. You pick two instruments to mix together and have a toot. Xylophone and bagpipes together at last. Tigger's treasure hunt. Here's a grid. Here's a children's character that rhymes with a slur. And here's how far away you are from the treasure. Apparently, I'm only five spaces away, but Oops. <laughs> no matter which five spaces I take, uh -oh. I can never seem to uh -oh. find the right Oops. place to uh -oh. go. This is the easy mode. How am I doing this so wrong? Am I four? Oh, wait. Oh, hang on. Wait a second. That that doesn't say five spaces, it says S for South. Rabbit's shape sorting is next and maybe we can help Christopher Robin with his homework. I think Rabbit has had a drink and this, this is the hardest one yet. You pick up the shapes and move them to the same shapes. Gopher, what did you do? And the final mini game is Owl's Word Shop, where you match the correct words to the correct beginning letter, which is just as fun as you can imagine. But what's even better is the way that Owl says certain words. Zebra, goat, mouse, and orange. Oh my, my, I hope that goat doesn't eat poop. Yep, so do I. <laughs> yep, if Winnie the Pooh Kindergarten was too heavy for you, then you may want to check out Winnie the Pooh Preschool. Pre. As in before school. Instead of a child eagerly learning their ABCs, we're a dumb toddler wandering around aimlessly while singing Tinky Winky did a stinky. If kindergarten was rated EC for early childhood, then this game should be re-rated to F for fetus. That's how young we're talking here. I can't wait to play with horse noise the poo. Okay, actually, to be fair, this one is totally different from kindergarten. For starters, it has way more cartoon cutscenes in between each minigame. And there's an actual story you're working towards, the games are different, the main menu is different. So far, I actually prefer it. If you're a crinkler, you might enjoy this. Every minigame here gets an announcement too. Tigger lives here. Kanga and Roo live here. Piglet's house. Owl's house. Rabbit's house and garden. Except for Eeyore. Because he finally did it. I shall visit Piglet. And before I get there, I'll do a long neon wee on his house. Piglet's house just puts you in a painting minigame. And I'm not joking when I say this, but the first canvas I was given was of the fed up poo meme. Even back in 1999, they knew. So let's get painting. I call this one the sepsis bear. I call this one the punished glutton. I call this one the honey is not fresh, mother. I call this one, oh demon. Where did the sky go? Do you think when Piglet grows up, he'll be called Pig? Next up, we're going to see Owl, and all we need to do is match up the pictures that are exactly the same. This picture is already where it should be. What are you talking about? They aren't the same. He's down here. Why are you wrong? You're corrupting our youth. Tigger's house is next, where we have to choose an instrument to put into a machine that plays the instrument. And that's all you do. To see Rabbit next, and hopefully he's sober this time. <laughs> you couldn't possibly help me. I mean, really. Well, screw you, asshole. I'm leaving. Would you help me can these- Nah, nah, no. You don't get to do that. You lost your chance two minutes ago, Rabbi. Piss off to Watership Down and get shot. So let's head off to Pooh's house next. I walk in the front door and... I end up in Kingdom Hearts 2. All we need to do is finish the stories with the correct start, middles, or endings. There once was a strawberry. Christopher Robin ate the strawberry. And then... The sun liked Christopher Robin. A tree was dead. It began to rain. And it turned into a loaf of bread. Yep, I'm done here. Let's check out Kanga's house instead. Rue and I were just making some alphabet soup. Perhaps our friend can help with the helping too. Please stop looking at me. Ooh. 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 See these missing letters here? We've got to find them. That's it. That's the best! alphabet soup I ever saw! Are you mentally ill? Your mother's soup has an entire block of cheese, tofu, a cube of human flesh, a dropping from rabbit, and a cigar in it. So with that, let's end things off with the final area, Eeyore's birthday party. And that's all he deserves. Either way, I am done with these kinds of games for a long time. I already did an entire video about baby games, and I do not wish to live through any of that ever again. They're games for babies, what do you expect? They get to play Tweenies Game Time when they get home. Now indeed, I have talked plenty about PS1 baby games on my channel before. In fact, I used to do it years ago before my channel underwent...
Just some changes. I took a look at 321 Smurf, designed for four year olds to be a kid's first ever kart racing game. And it's okay, a few too many Smurfs though. I took a look at the Tweenies Game Time, one of the ugliest and most insultingly simple games I've ever played that reminded me of a Razorhead. I took a look at Thomas the Tank Engine, a massive activity factory that was surprisingly content packed and lovingly made when it had no reason to be, all of those creepy faces aside. Only problem is, it was Japanese exclusive, so the fan base from the country the series was made never got to see it. Did you know that Qbert was coming? I didn't until I saw his nose. Sure, not every demo was perfect, like here when they tell you there's a trailer for Gex 3D, but it's actually for Gex Deep Cover Gecko. They outright spoiled a plot twist in Final Fantasy VII's trailer before the game even came out. And they did promote some real steaming cack in their time. Oh look, Spice World! Music for some of the trailers was a little weird too, like the ending of the Gran Turismo video where it just sounds like someone retching. <laughs> Sometimes though, these discs would even give you special features like tech demos, music videos, hints and tips for video games like Tony Hawk, and even extra long behind the scenes videos like with the making of Medieval. What the hell is that thing doing there? But I loved having these things for the artwork. I mean, look at the Resident Evil 2 demo cover even. This was old promotional art made for the game before they even figured out who the main character would be. I have one of the original promotional posters of that in my office, actually. Like, that's an adorably cool bit of gaming history. Gotta be honest, though, I'm not really sure about Agent Armstrong over here. What the hell am I looking at? Everything from his two belly buttons to him looking like he's stuck in a nappy makes me want to vomit. And why does he look like a balloon? Is he gonna fly away from the case? He'll be the second Armstrong to go to the moon. There wasn't only the cover art though, just look inside the sleeves of these things. Even though very tiny, these little screenshots and their rounded rectangular borders make them look like windows into the past when looking at them today. Talk about a different time. Look at this teaser image from Crash 2 featuring a screenshot from a part of the game that doesn't exist in the final version. I love looking at this stuff, it's like an alternate dimension. Like if geese had teeth, Sonic the Hedgehog had teeth, women had teeth, teeth had teeth. And when you actually got around to playing the games, it's so surreal real to go back to demo editions of some of my favourites and even have singular levels in this permanent state of unfinished or with graphics and sound effects missing. For instance, in Crash 2's demo, most of the sound effects are missing. And whenever you try to slide jump, Crash just stops in his place after he lands and doesn't keep on running. In Spyro 1, the hub world music wasn't finished yet, so they just used the theme song from the main menu. And in Karushi slash Intelligence Cube, there's no music at all. Or in A Bug's Life. Yeah! Just picking up grain here. In Crash 3, Crash has no shadow, and the bonus stage music hasn't been included yet. In Medieval's trailer, you see footage from a dragon chase level that never made it into the final game. In Oddworld, all of the areas they don't want you going into are boarded up with demo-exclusive signs they rendered in-game, which they also do with 3D objects in Tombi, and even with rock doors in Spyro. And speaking of Spyro, they didn't even finish the rescued dragon scenes for the playable levels they had, so just put the text on screen showing off what they said to you. All of these demos are like interactive concept art, you've gotta love it. What is happening to Silent Hill? You know what? I don't know. Looks weren't everything though. To top it off, the gameplay all of these demos gave you tasted just sweet enough where you could tell if you wanted the full thing or tell if a game will be a piece of feces. And the variety of games on the discs never left you feeling ripped off for paying for the magazine that it came with. Let's be honest though. We're all cheap bastards, aren't we? Everyone loves a freebie. A little, little finger up there. So what better way to introduce PlayStation owners to the world of demo discs than by bundling the console with an exclusive demo disc of its own. Part 4 what? Imagine unboxing your PS1 in 1995 and booting this up. Look how 90s this is. Listen to that pounding drum and bass. Check out all of the garbled text that's throwing random stats at you. And look at all of these nouns. Memory, data engine, graphics, VRAB. Did you know your PS1 was also a thesaurus? We get a little bit of full motion video, which still makes me want to shrivel up and cry. There it is, folks. The second coming of video games. Demo 1. Just look at this cover, and look at this menu, it's so damn stylish. It's a mixture of Tron and The Matrix, it's tricks, and if the trailer of Twisted Metal is anything to go by, these tricks weren't for kids. With a whopping 5 playable games, 2 interactive tech demos, and 8 videos that showed off pure gameplay and no stupid cinematic trailers, this was most if not all of the UK's introduction to the PS1. Just imagine watching videos for Jumping Flash, Tekken, Ridge Racer, Starblade Alpha, and then having the chance to play Wipeout, 
loaded destruction derby and battle arena to shinden oh god sony were you trying to make people throw the ps1 in a furnace and you know what i'm going to give a shout out to my usa brothers as well because with your demo discs you not only got some pretty adorable and creative menus but even got a lady that talked to you Whew, that was a close one I wonder why they keep shooting missiles at me. Probably because they're aiming at the octopus on your head. What you need to remember though is that as charming as these things are, they are still advertisements for upcoming games and they were gonna say anything to sell them to you. Fade to Black, still one of the best 3D adventures we've seen on the PlayStation. <laughs> No! Roscoe McQueen, we have exclusive footage of him wielding his famous giant hose. For ages, three to ten. Carmageddon, car plus flesh equals big mess. I didn't know Caitlyn Jenner had a video game. Moto Racer 2, the most fun you can have in a leather suit. Well, you clearly haven't been to my birthday parties. Toka Touring Cars, ever wanted to race a saloon car around a wet circuit in the Midlands? Go for it. Do you want me to buy the game or not? Crash Bandicoot 3, play a sizey chunk of the coot's latest. Is that a slur? I also did do a video on Crash Bash, but that was back in 2012. That was even before YouTube was taken over by Susan Wetwinky. And because that video is <laughs> terrible, I figured I'd drop myself into this video nice and gently and revisit Crash Bash to see if it really was the beginning of Crash's downfall after Naughty Dog dropped in to start making games about angry, hairy men. So I guess it's time to conclude this year's Bandicoot Month by acknowledging all of Crash's failures and getting them out of the way forever so that I never have to mention them again. These games I'll be talking about today have been heavily requested on my channel for years now so sorry for the wait i hope this is what you wanted oh wow check it out it's crash and bash em. i reviewed this game when i was a clean shaven child the graphics as well are actually quite pleasant the characters look good and i don't know what i was talking about this was the first crash game to be picked up by another random developer after naughty dog lost the rights of the character to universal and that does spell bad news at the offset but at least the new devs eurocom didn't try to poorly replicate the original formula they instead tried to do a mario party but with a gorilla with an anus for a face doesn't mean the game is great though despite it doing its own thing because spoiler warning i don't think it's that great can we judge the game by the first world of adventure? No. We can't. Ignore him. Now even though Crashly Bashly is a party game, if you're all by yourself, you can indeed play a single player adventure mode. Ooh, get you. And in adventure mode, I decided to pick Cortex because when he's running, his hands turn into a canary. But you can't call this an adventure without a story. I mean, what do you think this game is? Hiking. So the intro cutscene clues us in on what's going on. In the most basic of terms, Aku Aku and Uka Uka are having an argument, which almost leads to the worst boxing match of all time because none of them have any arms. Prepare to fight. No, Uka Uka. The ancients would not allow it. Ah, do you know what? Aku Aku is right. Yeah, we've never done that before at all. No, we don't fight because the ancients won't let them do it. No, not even once. Don't want to piss off those ancients. You know what's even weirder about this, though? The first line spoken in this cutscene is... How many times must you be told? You cannot defeat me. So why does Uka Uka even try to fight Aku Aku after all of that? Why give him the ancient's excuse? You both can't hurt each other. Aku Aku said so. Do you have memory loss, Uka Uka? Can Wood get Alzheimer's? Anyway, after this, Aku Aku has had enough and is about to bring the thunder. This bickering can go on no longer. Or he's gonna sound like a fed up mother. And logically, just like when you catch your own kids bickering, there's only one way to settle it. Illegal cage fighting. Yes, instead of settling this tiny squabble between themselves, these omnipotent and all-powerful masks decide to steal their supposed friends and pit them against each other until only one is left alive. And Crash is A-OK -okay with it. What is he doing? And so, by winning a random set of battle party games and fighting boss levels at the end of each warp room, your chosen character must beat out the competition for the glory of their own mask that forced them into this horror, and this somehow proves how great they are and who wins this pissy little argument. Even stranger, though, is that since I picked Cortex, I'm fighting for the evil side, and yet the boss levels are all the same if you picked the hero side. Even Uka Uka says in the boss cutscenes, You must first meet an old friend. So if they're old friends, why are we fighting the bosses? If the bosses are evil and friends with Uka Uka, including the final boss, doesn't that mean that the evil side already wins this argument by default? What's going on? Why are we fighting them? This story is a total disaster. No other words. It's as much of a mess as Tiny Tiger's character model. Cortex's hair, though, is on point. Look at it. It's so on point that it is a point. 
boy. His hair is so sharp he could open an envelope with it. So Crash to Coot Bash to Coot, like I mentioned earlier, is Mario Party for the entirety of the gameplay, but without the game board or dice to roll, and it's worse. You just win mini games over and over again to progress. And where some of these games on their own are totally passable and fun in their own right, where Crash Bash fails is with the tedium of it all. This is one of the most repetitive games I've ever played. In fact, it's so repetitive that in the first warp room, you get four-way pong, polar bear fighting, pogo stick bouncing, and 3D brawling. And then in the second warp room, you get four-way pong, polar bear fighting, pogo stick bouncing, and 3D brawling. Foon! Sure, there's an additional game mechanic added in for the copies, but they're still copies. They feel exactly the same to play. And many of these mini games are copied up to three times throughout the adventure mode in different warp rooms, with nothing but a different coat of paint. And that's not all. Get this. In order to unlock the boss battles from each warp room, you need a certain amount of trophies. And no, your wife doesn't count. To get the trophy on one of these levels, you need to win the mini game in question, not once, not twice, but three times. And this isn't a best out of three system or anything like that. The game keeps on going until anybody in the match wins three times, meaning that you could potentially replay the level nine times in a row in order to win just one trophy. And that's assuming you even win on the ninth attempt. So you get the four trophies from Warp Room 1, unlock Boss 1, and then think to yourself, God damn, I can't wait to see something new. Warp Room 2 has exactly the same minigame style as you just did, aside from one extra level you haven't seen before, and you still need to to win them all three times each and then all of a sudden boss 2 won't let you in because you need trophies gems and crystals to get inside but where do you get the gems and crystals from you bitch why by going back through all the levels you've already replayed a million times over and replaying them again but this time with an overly frustrating crutch like randomly growing insta kill mushrooms taking over the stage or you beginning the stage with less health than everybody else yes engine this is a great idea when two giant missile equipped mech suits can't take Take down a tiny bandicoot, just spin around and spit balls out of your mouth, I'll get them. So yeah, the single player adventure mode, aside from the decent bosses, it's pretty horrendous. And unfortunately, unless you own a first edition black labeled European version of Crash Bash, like I do, there's no code you can put in anywhere to unlock all of the multiplayer games straight away if you want to just jump into a match with a few friends. You have to go through the adventure mode and unlock everything in that tedious goddamn way. Otherwise, you're stuck with four mini games total with four different skins, and that is it. Unless you have a copy of Spyro 3. Yes, stay with me. By holding L1 and R2 on the title screen for Spyro 3 and pressing square, you get access to a hidden Crash Bash demo. And then, if you type in a specific code on the title screen of the demo, you are then granted access to a cheat menu, where you can not only manipulate and change basically everything on the screen, but also have access to nearly every single level, fully multiplayer compatible and all. You are missing a few of the final mini games, and you only have three bosses to pick from, boss three of which apparently being Homer Simpson. <laughs> But yes, essentially, nearly the entire Crash Bash game is hidden on a Spyro 3 disc, which I guess just goes to show you how little space Crash Bash's full disc was using in the first place. I can't believe they left this here accidentally. It's so damn cool. Look, you can even see the exact date and time that this beta build of the game was placed onto the Spyro 3 disc. How adorable. Aww. Okay, what I just said about the no effort thing, that was harsh. There is quite a bit of effort put into some of Crash Bash. The soundtrack, for instance, is one of Crash's best on the PS1. In fact, below Crash 2, I'd say it was the second best, so go and check it out. And when you do have all the mini games unlocked, it is a decent distraction with friends, but getting to that point legitimately, which the majority of players of this game had to do, is hellish. Too many freeze frames I was able to grab from this game were absolutely horrifying and a far cry from the detail you'd expect from the Crash universe, even on the PS1. And come on, man, Cortex's head here looks like a boiled egg on top of a frisbee. I can see a good game here. It's not in there. In the distant past on this channel, I've taken a look at three Pixar games, and I thought they were all pretty great. A Bug's Life on PS1, despite what critics that probably don't wash say, I think is a great time. A stage-by-stage -stage collectathon and enemy hunting game with decent visuals, decent controls, and incredible music. Even better, at the end of the game, you get to chase down and stop Kevin Spacey from touching everyone inappropriately. As such, 102 Dalmatians on the PlayStation, because 101 children wasn't enough, and they just had to push one more out. And before anything else happens, we need to address the elephant in the room. This this is the most revolting thing I've ever seen in my life. Is that Cruella Deville or Michael Jackson? Now nah, I don't mind too much because I really like the disc at least. It's really cute. It's almost like I cut off a slice of a cow and stuck it in the PS2. This menu though, no, I don't like this at all. All of these spots forming in the background make me feel like I'm coming down with bronchitis. Hey Domino.
Anna, what's this? I found a Skeletor action figure. Ruined. Ah, oh my good god of grapes. I was wrong. That's not Michael Jackson. It's the Tin Man. Cruella looks absolutely horrendous. Why does she have the head shape of a can of beans? Oh, look, dipstick. What did you just call me? It's coming on the TV right now. What is? My dipstick? What can we do, darling? I'll tell you what we can do. I'll grab Cruella and shove her in my triangular whistle hole. The voice acting in this cutscene. I mean, it's perfect. It can't be improved. Not even Barry Wilton can make it better. Just listen to how the TV news reporter is cut off to carry on the story. Scotland Yard is now on the case and... <gasps> I just can't believe it. I haven't seen a story told this well since the last season of Slot. My favourite bit, though, is right here when Pongo realises that Cruella is stealing puppies again and there's an amazing dramatic zoom into his wife. It's that horrid Cruella de Vil up to her old tricks. Would you believe that 102 Dalmatians is a Spyro clone? Because it is. Look at it. You run around, jump around, collect items, bark at enemies like breathing fire. It's Spyro. Granted, it's Spyro for five-year-olds, so it is painfully easy. I mean, just look at these enemies here. Nemesis missed leg day. You even need to find a set amount of valuable items to unlock more areas. But instead of orbs or dragon eggs, it's your siblings. All right. You're welcome, prick! This game does have a very special feature in it, though, and it's known as the VOM camera, so named because whenever you move, it makes you VOM. Not only does it follow every single move you do like a cult, including flying as close behind you as possible whenever you jump or fall, but it also can't be adjusted upwards or downwards, only left and right. So I hope you enjoy Secret Diaries of an Upskirt Dog Photographer, and don't you even dare think about switching puppies. Just look at this. Who thought this was a good idea? It's giving me bile duct leakage. In fact, no. I changed my mind. This is the best idea I've ever seen. I think every single game used to make you throw up on the side of a shop window every time you change your mind. I mean, who needs $400 VR when you can spend as little as $20 to turn your PS1 from grey to beige with your own mouth? Something here that did make me laugh, though, is the destruction of these toy enemies. I don't know why, but they make the most violent sound in the whole game, and the toys themselves fire off into the distance like the Hindenburg. <laughs> I don't know why, it just tickles me. All of a sudden, we're sucked into a giant logo, okay? And then we're greeted with this thing, hate. All I know is hate. I am Sergeant Tibbs. Then we get inside this toy factory, and lo and behold, now the camera is too far up. I couldn't handle it anymore when I got to Cruella de Vil pinball. That's a sentence I never thought I'd say. Because all that happens is you get bounced around all of Cruella's bouncy lumps. Forever and ever, you can never stop. Uh, no one knows when you go, or where you go, or where are you going, or when you stop. Who, who knows where you're going? I don't know where you're going. It, it doesn't matter. You can't get out. It's just stuck here forever, so you can't handle this anymore. From staring up inside the gallbladder of a puppy to the spinning character switching to the Cruella pinball bouncing, I think I'm gonna spew. Just stop everything right now. Oh, look. The game is paused. So a few years ago, I made a video about Thrill Kill, a PS1 game that was never actually released at all from how controversial it was back in 1998. But since that video, I managed to grab myself a custom-made physical copy on eBay with a manual, soundtrack, and everything. Even better, it actually works on my hacked PS2, and it's just as I remember it. Right down to the flames that cut off from the bottom of the screen to make it look like they're really there. Bella Donna with the stringy poo coming out of her head, Mammoth, who reminds me of a fig, Dr. Forsters, who might as well be called Dr. Dr. Fawcett because he looks like a tap, and Cletus, who has an alternate costume where he takes some of the blood from around his face and uses it to stick a wig on. And then of course there's the game itself in all of its glory, complete with the AI that all do nothing but gang up on you and tear your head off like you're a grandma on Black Friday, and everything else about the game being nowhere near as deserving to be banned as it was when I first laid eyes on it. There were plenty of games just as violent, if not more violent than this on the PS1 that came out way before Thrill Kill, and even if this was the most gruesome and offensive game of all time, it's still just as good as this lady's costume of a traffic light. Hang on, I think I know why this game was really banned. You don't need to hide it from me. It's because it had a cross-eyed costume, isn't it? It's a totally aimless, button-mashing four-player fighter with no strategy, nothing to learn, a terrible auto-lock-on, no individual health bars to strategize who you should knock out, matches that go on forever in a million rooms shaped like a box, repetitive animations, and the only really suggestive content being a big burly man in tight-fitting leather with a chain whip and a lady doing a moan. <laughs> Not to mention, I don't think I can ever unsee the image of a small man on stilts with a thong dressing up like a member of the village people. Don't get me wrong, I'm more than happy to have this on my shelf as a cool little custom piece of gaming history that was never meant to be sold. 
but I just don't think the game is very good. Let's play party time with Winnie the Pooh instead. Now you and all of your friends can have a party with Pooh. And all you need is a toilet and a ladle. You want to know the story of good old Winnie Bear's party time? Well, it begins with an alien getting his nose out and then having private time with the floor, which then leads us to a title screen. Winnie the Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Okay, time to enter my name. Hello, my name is Munt. And you know what? I'm feeling a bit hardcore, so I'm gonna dabble with a bit of hard difficulty mode today. <laughs> and I think I'm gonna pick Tigger, because he looks a little drunk and needs some help getting home. Weirdly enough, though, there's no choice to pick Eeyore. I think he might have finally done it. The real story begins, and it turns out there's a treasure map that appears out of thin air, and we all want to follow it to find Rabbit's secret stash after it gets thrown into the air. Gopher pops up from under the ground, like the filthy vermin he is, and gets the map stuck on his back, angers a load of bees, and runs away. So we have to chase him to get our map back. The game begins, Gopher runs for about three seconds and then we're stuck in a loading screen. We play about a minute of a mini game and then we're stuck in a loading screen. Gopher runs for about three seconds, we slump along like we were caught evading our taxes and then we're stuck in a loading screen. We play another mini game for about a minute and then we're stuck in a loading screen. This game's loading screens are perfect for children because obviously they're so well known for their high attention spans. I know it looks a lot like Mario Party but it really is. It's completely linear with nothing interesting happening on the board sections aside from just moving forward. There's no luck element to make things more interesting. And how far you move along the board is based entirely on your performance in the minigames each character lands on. And as far as my performance in the minigames go, it's quite frankly terrible. Since every time I push bombs back in this minigame, they decide to teleport back to me and make me fail. The other minigames are just as insipid though. When you aren't driving around in a circle 15 times, you're stuck in a tiny arena collecting fruit and throwing it into a basket. This one happens quite a lot actually, and I'm really good at it too, because I can drop an unlimited supply of bananas behind my feet every half a second. Well that was a good start! One of my earliest videos I even took a look at Santa Claus Saves the Earth, and that was... <laughs> I'm sorry everyone, I just... I, I, I haven't been this emotional since I saw Saving Ryan's Private. Oh! The movie Atlantis looks really good and has good characters. Yep. What a perfect film to base a video game on. So how do you turn the most forgettable, unvideo gamey movie of all time into a video game? Let's find out right now by going to the special features. I'm going. The game starts up and we're forced into an extremely basic tutorial. And when I say basic... Whoa! Very good. I really mean basic. We're playing Simon Says with an old man. Hey, can you jump like me? <laughs> hey there, young man. Do you remember how to look? This is how you look. And unfortunately, the main game doesn't get any less basic. This here is an explorative adventure game with collectathon elements and swapping characters around to do certain tasks because stronger characters like Vinny and Milo can push objects. Women can't push things. You know what this reminds me of? Resident Evil mixed with. Donkey Kong 64. It feels like Resident Evil with all the item collecting, examining, manually combining things together in the inventory, and then manually using them on the right objects in the environment directly from your inventory without it happening automatically. That's stuff I can appreciate. But it feels like Donkey Kong 64 with the sheer amount of backtracking and character swapping in order to get back to one particular obstacle that one character can clear, carrying on a little bit, finding another obstacle that another character has to interact with, so backtracking to another character swap station, passing that original obstruction, then getting blocked again later on in the level, going back to a character swap station and repeating it until your knob falls off. And all of this is annoying enough, but it starts to affect just basic moving along too, because some of the characters that should be able to do some things can't do them in specific situations when they can every other time. So the game has been designed to make me second guess absolutely everything I do. Have I got the wrong character for this situation? Is it even possible to do this with any character? Or is the game just a whiff? Some wooden crates can be blown up, but some can't. Some grabbing platforming can be done with one character, but some can't. Sometimes you have chronic heart pain, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't. Not only that, but some character-specific items need to be interacted with by standing in a very specific area of the item that you're trying to interact with. And not only would you need to figure out that location to begin with by just pressing action all over the place until you get a message, but then you need to make sure you've got the right character equipped to interact with it, meaning more backtracking to a character switching station and then heading back again. And that's even if the characters are available, because most of the time, they can't be accessed from that particular station, and you've got to go even further back to find the right station to switch out. Other than that, though, there's not much to say, just like the movie. It looks fine, it's not absolutely terrible, but it won't make me keep my hands below the blanket. Now this, 
This is where shit starts getting good. Yes, you lads, it's Spyro 2. He's back, and I'm back. Look alive, everyone. It's Simon 2, ripped my ropes. Or as I personally know it, Simon 2, great. A garden. To be honest, I prefer the European name of Gateway to Glimmer against Ripto's Rage, but I will admit it is strange. Glimmer is just the first level of the game. You're never looking for a gateway to it. That'd be like if this was called Crash Bandicoot. San. Straight away, we've got much better cutscenes with actual story in them, and boom, bang, bing, we've got new characters who are better than anything we saw in Spyro 1. You've got the Professor, who's a bastard mold, got Alora, who's a fawn, you dork, and Hunter the Cheater, who always looks like he wipes with his fingers. Even Simon's voice is improved. Is this rain ever gonna stop? I've forgotten what the sun looks like. If you don't know, that is the voice of Tom Kenny, and if you don't know who that is, I'll give you a hint. Now they've set up force fields to separate us. If you can find diodes, you can use them to turn off the force fields. One thing though, why, only in the cutscenes, does it sound like the voice actors are spitting into the mics? That's exactly the point. A dragon is our only chance of stopping Ripto. Oh, there's also the new baddie, Ripto, who is very small and angry, and that's basically all there is to him. I never really understood the love for him as a villain, I'm sorry. And these three bozos accidentally summoned him to their world, so intercepted Spyro on the way to his holiday. Oh, sorry. Vacation. Yeah, your best friends in this game kidnap you and hold your holiday hostage until you fix their big messy. Thanks so much, you woman. Donkey. Spyro 2 as a game, though, is basically Spyro 1 again, but everything is better. Literally everything. It's like jumping from Crash 1 to Crash 2, or pre-vomit to post-vomit. There's just so many quality of life changes here, it's not even funny. The glide falls a little bit slower to make long jumps easier, the charge controls a lot tighter and lets you jump higher while charging to make rushing around levels twice as easy, Sparks the Dragonfly picks up gems from further away, he eats butterflies from burnt animals much faster than Spyro 1, the camera moves around you a bit faster, the sound Sound effects are guttier and have more punch to them. And on top of the updates to existing ideas, there's all of the new stuff added in too, like auto-saving, which was a massive deal, because back in those days, we didn't have it. Now you have a hover move to give you extra time to correct a glide and give you a tad more height and distance at the end of your glide. Now, instead of getting extra lives from the life Clam. While Sparks is at full health, you can stack him with multiple burned animals to eventually give you a life if you eat enough. Spyro can <laughs> spit. Enemies now don't drop gems to collect and instead add to a defeated enemy tally that can help you unlock a temporary power-up specific to that level, giving you way more chances for supercharging alongside brand new powers like spring jumping, projectile super breath attacks, and temporary flight in the level. And speaking of levels, you now only need to collect one thing at the end of the stage to beat it, with optional missions dotted around each level, awarding you orbs that can be used to unlock further levels, bosses, and secrets. And they can sometimes be centered around the platforming that Spyro does best, or something totally new and different like hockey matches against this freak, various puzzles hidden around the stage, or blowing up a load of UFOs piloted by <laughs> And to top it all off, when you collect everything, you get a little dote! The Speedway stages return and are exactly the same as previously. Okay, that wasn't new. I'm sorry. I don't know why I mentioned it. But now after you beat the main time travel challenge, you can then freely explore the Speedway level without a time limit to find secret hidden characters to talk to that then give you more unique orb missions that change up the gameplay even more. And then you can end your day by being a flag-burning filthy hippie. Yeah, down with... Down, down with vegetables! Oh yeah, there's also way more cutscenes now too. Some for entertaining story bits, and others for whenever you enter and exit a new level, just to give them that extra dash of personality and depth to them. I like them. You see what the problems are in the level before you get there, help them out, then you fix the problem and see what happens after you leave the level. What's cool though is that every level has inhabitants to talk to now, and they're nearly all fully voice acted. The only other thing you could interact with in Simon 1 was the balloonist, and sorry man, not only did you not actually speak, but you are only ever good for being a stepladder. Even the fairy checkpoint talks to you now. She's called Zoe, and she likes to pitch shift her voice at random. That zap means that if you get into trouble, I'll return you to this place. Each time you defeat an enemy, it will release a spirit particle. But then there's another character introduced in this game that would go on to become a Spyro staple. Hello there, Spyro. Would you like to learn to swim underwater? I suppose I could teach you for... 
And a small fee? Money bags as a round bell end seems to exist everywhere all at once on every level and only lives for one thing. Locking things away from you and stealing your gems in order to unlock them for you. That's all he is. He's a fat, greedy barrier that has no conscience, no dignity, and only cares about money. Money, money, He is a leech, a st- Dane. Oh, what's that? You want to sell me a trip on a submarine to get by a load of robot sharks? Pfft, I don't need any of that. You're scamming me. Look, see, I don't need to- Okay, fair enough. Oh, look at you there, money bags. Are you a little cold from the snow? Oh no, wait, it's just your soul! My favorite thing to do with him is actually use a double jump glitch in level 1 to not only completely ignore him and his stupid bridge, but also use the same glitch to get on top of a ledge that I'd also need to pay him later on in the game to learn how to climb, and then finish off the rest of the level without paying him a cent, meaning that I can then afford his swimming lessons right after level 1 without needing to go into another level first to try and save up enough. This has been a money-saving tip with Daddy Kade. Next week, We'll find out how to stop yourself from spending your own money by learning how to keep pennies in your ass. The levels are bigger and give you way more stuff to do and leave a longer lasting impression, but they aren't so big as to make you go, oh no, I can't eat that. And the music is miles better as well. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it sucks. Milkshake through a big straw. It's way more creative, zesty, multi-instrumental, and more percussive. There's even vocals on some of the tracks, my favourites being the one that sounds like a meditating Mr. Bean. Then there's all the little monk dudes with their mouths that look like urinals and they go If you ask me though, the award for best line in the game easily goes to Even though I'm a vegetarian, I think you should kill that yeti. <laughs> He's so hardcore about killing an animal that he even goes off script. Kill! Oh by the way, I have a theory about this game that I don't think anybody has ever brought forward before. Hunter is Repto. And no, I don't mean just because of their exact same size. Other characters in the game are all like, eh, can you help me tie my shoelaces? And then you help them and they reward you. But Hunter, Hunter, he deliberately bricks himself in igloos and hides orbs from you until you nearly kill yourself on a jet ski parachute. He won't give you two orbs that you desperately need to save the world unless you run around in a sub-zero cave catching crystals to amuse him. He won't give you the items that you need to defeat the man that he summoned himself until you jump on his captured manta ray and follow a seahorse through a bubble of fart. He plays dumb, but he's not dumb. He has like half of the orbs you already need in his pocket and just doesn't give them to you because because Lamau. And have you ever noticed how you never see them together on the same screen? He's the bad guy here. He is Ripto. I also love the way that so many characters have that low poly PS1 over exaggerated head and mouth shape too. They all look like talking drum cymbals. There's even this one level where you run around and find all of the bones of a skeleton to put him back together. How beautiful is that? It's so good to see my friend looking healthy again. Does he? Oh no, what does that mean? What's gonna happen? Yes, I had to sit through the whole thing, so you had to as well. Now, let's move on to- I think he wants to dance for you. Oh no, 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 no. My favorite part of the whole game, though, is when you get to World 2, Autumn Plains, and find this level called Zeph, <laughs> where there are all these slugs on the ground in the middle of a civil war with these birds from the sky, and you help out the slugs by destroying the birds' ammunitions building. Wow! What an explosion! My disc is a little scratched. But then immediately after that is another level called Breezy Windpipe, where you go to the homeland of the birds in that same war, and then you help them get their airship running again so they're able to counterattack attacks <laughs> ensuring that the war can rage on for many years to come. I love Zephyr anyway, though, because there are these baby birds that spit ammunition from mother birds dropping it from the sky into their mouths, and when they don't have anything, they're like, Mommy, Mommy, I'm hungry, feed me, Mommy. Oh, you're hungry, are you? Yeah, well, I've got your mummy right here, you little scab. Then there's a bit where there's a slug named Romeo and a bird named Juliet in a tragic star-crossed love on the battlefield and you need to reunite them in this extremely fun magic seed platforming puzzle where different platforms grow in different soil and when you want the seed back, the soil clenches like a bumhole and after solving the puzzle, Juliet sounds like this. Romeo, 
Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Oh, there's Romeo. There's just so many fantastic moments here. How about that mission where you have to get the professor's pencil back by trading an egg with a nest that spits out a seed to go into a plant pot that spits out a rubber duck that goes with a duck family to give you a turnip? What? Okay. Which then needs to go into a cauldron which spits out a coin that goes into a water fountain that gives you a very soggy pencil. It's so good, man. And how about the secret agent that sounds like I'm a secret agent. And when he's looking around to make sure you aren't following him, he does. He, d he does that. That is how I'm looking around for things for the rest of my life. And the robots in Metropolis, they're adorable. Listen to them. These elevators need serious work, see? Even the bosses are an improvement. There's only three this time, but it doesn't matter because they all make up for the wet jokes that were in Spyro 1. They actually have attacks. They're fun fights, and in Gulp's case, even a little bit challenging. This is one of the better bosses in the whole Spyro series, actually. As great as Simon 2 is, though... I don't think it's perfect. In fact, there's a couple of major real low points for me. This, I'm taking, this is way too hot. And pushing up roses can name like 50 of them, can't you? Oh, Spyro. Uh... A mission in Hurricos where you have to put lightning stones into power generators and then have to defeat the thieves that keep removing them and throwing them around the level. I mean, look, I'm very glad that I finally get some representation. But man, does this take forever. It isn't difficult, just immeasurably boring. This part here where you need to flame fish into this angry Tiki's mouth, I can't stand this bit. You need to get 10 fish in his mouth and any red fish reset the counter by like a million fish. But by the time you see the yellow ones and decide that they're the ones to flame, it's too late to flame and you miss the mouth. Nowadays, I just cheat this bit by looking directly into the water in first person mode to see what fish is coming. Well, is it cheating? I'm just using what the game gives me. I'm a good boy. I, I wash under my arms. And of course, there's another bit, which is possibly the most infamous part of the whole game. But before we get there, I just have to ask you a quick question. Trouble with the trolley. Okay, well, actually, get ready for me to be a contrarian. This isn't hard. It's not easy, but it's really not that bad. I don't know what you're talking about, you whinging wet. In fact, while recording footage for this video, I finished the mission first time and then had to start the mission again and deliberately blow up in order to record the guy saying, Trouble with the trolley, eh? I mean, I don't know what to add. It just isn't that hard. And you know what else isn't? The turtle soup mission? Yeah, I said it. What's the big deal? Just keep looping around the pipes that they spawn from and then knock the turtles away if you come across them. They'll bounce all over the place and it gives you plenty of time to get them back in the water. What's the big deal, you baby bitch buggers? And the dinosaur egg hatching and eating the village people. Yeah, sure, I failed this one like once or twice, but once you get the pattern down, it's just like Simon says. But if Simon only had eight Simon noises for you to copy and then Simon played the same Simons every time you Simon. And what about the bombing genie mission in Scorch? Not a big deal either. Did it on my first go. Here's a tip for you if you're struggling. Stop charging after him and stick to the wall so that you avoid most of the bombs bouncing off of them. You can't rush this bit, just go slowly, especially around the steps. You're gonna hate it if you try charging, trust me. Nah, mate, you wanna know what the worst mission of the game is? Will you escort me past those earth shapers? No! How about instead you suck my nads? I hate this. I hate this so much. So you've got this motherless goat who has a potion to give Hunter because he wasted his month's rent on a new pair of concrete Nikes, and even though the goat is literally next door to where Hunter is, he might momentarily forgets how to steer his own legs and ends up going on a cross-country marathon instead, deliberately walking right into all of the enemies, changing his mind on where he's going all the time, getting in the way of you, rushing around, and you can't get rid of the enemies. All you can do is knock them back temporarily, so getting them all out of the way of him in advance won't work. And the best thing, the 10 out of 10 game of the year best thing that happens is that if you finish this mission, Hunter then says, thanks for getting me out, Spyro, but you need to learn a new move to help me kill all of these monsters. So you carry on playing the game, learn the move, come back to the level to help out Hunter, and he couldn't wait five minutes to put his Adidas stones back on, meaning you've got to do the first part of the mission all over again? What's that? I already have this orb? I had no idea. But anyway, you finish the game and do everything. You get the orbs, grab the talismans, run away from this horrific face, and wonder who decided to bring back the bush munchers from Spyro 1 so you can place an Aztec curse on their family. You finally beat Ripto, and he just accepts his death. Oh, screw it, I can't win. Everybody celebrates, Hunter sits on Moneybag's face, and we finally go on a holiday in a lovely final cutscene. <laughs> it isn't a cutscene, I got you. 
<laughs> Dragon Shores is the final level that is literally just a fun fair that rewards you with tickets in order to unlock a theater to watch the game's cutscenes again. Uh. Internet. You play a game of water dunking, ride a roller coaster with a cannon to pop balloons, go to a duck shooting gallery, and never question why the biggest enemies from the first game are now welcoming you into a dark room inside a theme park with no one else in it. And you know what? I also really like the little love boat tunnel because it taught all the kids that played this game that you can love whoever you want. You can love the same gender. You can find love even if you're a smelly, hairy yeti. If that's not your style, you can be on your own. You can have a three-way what? You can love children. Excuse me? And after all all of this, if you found every gem and every orb in the game, you unlock a door that grants you a permanent super breath attack, which is now obsolete because the game is already over, screw off. Unless you do a Tiger Woods. And cheat. Yeah, just quit the game and then start a new game that overrides the completed save file and voila, you now have super breath from the minute you start the game. How sick is that? And that's not all that you can cheat. Do you want to make Simon look like he has leprosy? Because you can do that. What? That's still not enough? Well, how about a big head mode? Yeah, you can do that too. Finally, a game character just for me. What? Is that still not enough? Well, how about this? You put Spyro in a trouser press. The end.